Next, it's coverage of a hearing concerning international drug prices. The House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Health and the Environment met on Monday to focus on why U.S. drug prices are higher than those of similar pharmaceuticals in Canada and Europe. The subcommittee heard from representatives of pharmaceutical companies and consumer groups. The panel also took testimony from General Accounting Office officials. We now turn to the hearing chaired by Congressman Henry Waxman of California. The meeting of the subcommittee will come to order. I want to wish you all a good morning. I'm pleased to convene this hearing on international prescription drug prices. The hearing reflects the subcommittee's continuing interest in and concern about the troubling increases in drug prices. And we have two other hearings planned. Next month, we will review the Office of Technology Assessment Study on Prescription Drug Research Costs and Profits. In April, we're planning a hearing on whether NIH is sufficiently demanding when turning over government-funded research to drug companies. We also intend to take a careful look at some of the ways that large purchasers are saving money on prescription drugs today. I'd like to dedicate this hearing today to consumers of prescription drugs who are fed up with high drug prices. In recent years, I probably have received more mail on this issue than on any other. In fact, the idea for the GAO's U.S. Canadian drug price study came from those letters. Consumers wrote asking a simple question, why are prescription drug prices so much higher in the United States than in Canada? When I looked into the issue, I found that there was a lot of debate about the methodology of existing studies. We asked GAO to resolve the issue once and for all to compare the prices of the top selling 200 U.S. drugs with the prices for the very same drugs in Canada. GAO found that Americans pay an average of 32 percent more for drugs than do our Canadian neighbors. In some cases, the prices were 200 percent, 300 percent, and in one case, 967 percent higher in the United States than in Canada. The Canadian differential is particularly relevant because U.S. drug prices have increased so rapidly in recent years. Every year for the past 12 years, drug prices have increased faster than the rate of inflation. During that period, drug prices rose an average of 128 percent, more than six times the rate of general producer prices in this country. These extraordinary price increases are not needed to justify a reasonable profit. In 1992, the drug industry's profits measured as a percentage of sales were more than four times the profits of the average Fortune 500 company. This pattern of profiteering has been repeated year after year. As we work through these hearings, I plan to consider all viable options for easing the prescription drug burden that consumers are bearing. But one option that I don't believe will be acceptable is to simply have the federal government pay the drug companies whatever they want to charge. The President has made clear that unrestricted prescription drug price increases are unacceptable. Perhaps the testimony that we will hear today about what Canada and other countries do to successfully contain drug prices will help us find a solution. I recognize that the drug companies have discovered some wonder drugs that are critical to treating serious illnesses. And I want to protect the incentives to perform research on breakthrough drugs. But I understand that all drug research, on, uh, all drug research is not directed at important drugs. I also understand that the drug industry spends substantially more every year on advertising than they spend on research. Surely there is room to lower prices while still preserving important research incentives. I hope that we can all jointly search for ways of lifting this burden from the sick and the elderly, and I look forward to hearing the testimony of the witnesses today. I want to call on my colleagues for opening statements before we uh, 
uh, ask our witnesses to come forward and recognize uh, Congressman McMillan first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, for the opportunity to explore this important issue of uh, drug price differentials in the United States and abroad. And I sincerely hope that we can objectively examine this issue because I think it's an important one. The GAO report that was published last September is the focus of much of this hearing today, and I found the conclusions of this report disturbing, not so much because of their conclusions, but because of the poor methodology uh, in which uh, it was undertaken. On page two of the report, it states, and I quote, the major source of U.S.-Canadian differences in drug prices is not variations in manufacturers' costs. Hmm. This holds true regardless of whether the cost differences relate to research and development, marketing, production, or distribution, unquote. When I looked through the report to examine the evidence that would support this claim, I was stunned to discover that the conclusion that research and development, marketing, production, and distribution do not contribute to price differential, differentials <coughs> was based on discussions with, quote, pharmaceutical industry experts and some manufacturers, unquote. Not only were the names of these experts not footnoted, I could find no substantive information to support the claim. I suggest that real cost differential is the meat and that we, that we are looking for, and this report doesn't seem to discover it. The report does acknowledge that little R&D is done in Canada. In 1990, 8.8% of pharmaceutical sales was spent on research and development in Canada, while about 17% of sales was spent in the United States. If, uh, if you accept that, this means that the U.S. devotes 50% more of its sales to research and development uh, than does Canada on the average. But I think overall averages on a composite group of products don't seem to make much sense since research and development costs vary considerably with a given product, something that otherwise was ignored in this report. Again, based on conversations with so-called experts, this report concludes that this does not have an impact on price differentials. Wait a minute. I can't agree with a conclusion based on hearsay evidence. We're trying to get facts here. Furthermore, the report does not even mention the differences in product liability law and the associated uh, cost, nor the different regulatory environments between the two countries and the associated cost, which can be, I think we would all agree, enormous. The current GAO report neither considers enough of the variables involved nor adequately explores the variables it does consider. I hope this hearing will sh shed light on how research and development, product liability laws, regulation, and changes in currency exchange rates affect U.S. prescription drug prices compared to those uh, abroad. And when we do this, we need to make darn certain that we are comparing apples and apples and using good solid methodology. As has been said so often in the last few months, we can do better. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Mr. Wyden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you for all of your effort over these many years to get a fair shake uh, for the consumer and commend you for initiating this important uh, series of hearings. It seems to me that when the drug companies charge more in the United States than they do in Canada for the very same drug, they are exercising what they consider to be a God-given right to wring as much money out of the U.S. consumer as possible. Exercising the so-called right is made easier because our government has failed to adopt policies that would unleash real market forces that could lower drug prices for the consumer. Now, several of the key arguments that the U.S. drug companies have made to defend the status quo are unraveled in the GAO testimony. For example, the companies have long argued that their prices are justified on the basis of the high cost for research and development. The GAO report offers more evidence that this R&D argument is a hoax by pointing out that R&D costs are not allocated to specific products in specific countries. Now, I think we'd all agree that the pharmaceutical industry does much to save lives and create jobs. Our challenge now as part of this year's comprehensive health care reform legislation is to preserve these important contributions 
while getting a more fair shake for the consumer on the pricing of medicines. Towards this end, I'm going to introduce legislation this week to require that when U.S. taxpayers offer to fund biomedical research partnerships between the government and drug companies, the companies that bid for the right to obtain this research subsidy would have to compete on the basis of the price to be charged for the drug therapies that are produced by the partnership. At present, drug companies compete without any regard to the price of the drug therapies. Prices get discussed only after the commercial partners close the deal to get taxpayer-funded research. And at this point, as is so often the case, the U.S. government has lost all its leverage to obtain a fair price for the consumer. This legislation would also end the routine granting of an exclusive marketing agreement to the winning drug company bidder and would direct the National Institutes of Health to co-license multiple companies as R&D partners, an arrangement that also should produce more real price competition in the marketplace. Finally, under this legislation, if only one company can meet the government's non-price requirements, government negotiators and the drug company would have to agree in advance of closing a deal on a specific price discount. At present, Mr. Chairman, the only way that drug prices seem to go down is for consumers to become too impoverished to pay for price gouging or a government implements policies that promote fairer pricing. I know you and a majority of our colleagues want to see government policies put in place that promote fairer pricing, and I look forward to working with you and our colleagues to bring about that end. Thank you, Mr. Wyden. Mr. Upton? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to thank you for holding this hearing to clarify the findings of the GAO report comparing prescription drug prices in Canada and the U.S. I look forward to hearing the testimony of all of the witnesses and would like to welcome a constituent from my own district, Kalamazoo, Mr. Lee Smith, who is Vice Chairman of the Board of Upjohn. National health care reform is at the forefront of this year's legislative agenda. Skyrocketing health costs and lack of access to adequate health care for all are forcing us to rethink our own system. And I asked to be on this subcommittee so that I could constructively contribute to addressing our health care problems. I have a great hope that health care reform can and should be addressed in a bipartisan manner. That is why I'm somewhat concerned about the rhetoric flying about that singles out the drug industry as scapegoats. I don't think that this is necessarily constructive or will help lead to a balanced and comprehensive reform that is needed for our health system. In our national health care system, pharmaceuticals are a small but very important component. Accounting for only about 5% of the American health care dollar, that, their contributions to the health of our nation far outweigh their costs. For example, it costs a person $1,000 a year in medicine to prevent a heart attack. However, to accomplish similar results, through sur surgery costs 40 times that amount. And we must recognize that often even the most expensive drugs are the most cost-effective means of health care. If we are ever to achieve meaningful reductions in the cost of our, of our nationwide health care, we must adopt a strategy of stimulating more pharmaceutical research and development rather than hampering it. Drawing increased attention is the discrepancy between drug prices in the U.S. and other countries. Although these differences exist, we must strike a balance between short-term gains and long-term investments. And we must look very closely at studies which attempt to estimate and explain these differences. Shortly, we'll have the GAO testify on their U.S.-Canadian price comparison study. And we will look very closely at the assumptions and methods used by the GAO. For example, the GAO report compared the best available price from the Ontario drug benefit formula with a sticker price for U.S. products. This compares the Canadian lowest price and the U.S. highest wholesale price, which is the price before application of rebates and discounts. The GAO U.S. price does not include several rebates and negotiated discounts, a lot like apples and oranges. I've been informed by Upjohn that approximately 80% of their volume in pharmaceuticals is discounted in some manner. Clearly, this points to a major question mark about the GAO study, which used the U.S. wholesale price before discounts. Mr. Chairman, the U.S. is the leader in this global industry, responsible for half of the new prescription medicines developed in the last five years. Scientists, manufacturers, and patients all over the world look to the, this country for the latest research that one day will be a cure for Alzheimer's, AIDS, cancer, diabetes, arthritis, and so on. 
Currently, there is no universally accepted formula that compares the cost of drugs in one country with another. There are too many factors involved, government price controls, exchange rates, health care financing practices. If we are ju to judge the cost of drugs, then we must take into consideration the total cost of health care jobs, productivity, and lives saved. To solve the health care crisis facing America, all industries involved in health care delivery must come under the magnifying glass and be scrutinized. But it must be a fair examination so as not to penalize those making a good faith effort to make our health care system available and effective for all Americans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Upton. Mr. Greenwood? Our um, first witness today is Janet Scheichels, the Director of Health uh, Financing and Policy Issues for the General Accounting Office. Ms. Scheichels is accompanied by Jonathan Ratner and David Gross. I'd like to ask you if you would to come forward. We're pleased to welcome you to our subcommittee hearing this morning. Your prepared statement will be made uh, part of the record in its entirety. We'd like to recognize you now for your uh, oral presentation to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to introduce my colleagues who worked with me on this study. On my left is, uh, you mentioned John Ratner and David Gross on my right. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, we're pleased to be here today to discuss the results of our recent report that compared U.S. and Canadian prescription drug prices, which we prepared at your request. There is widespread concern in the United States about rising prescription drug prices and drug spending, as you mentioned in your opening statement. There is also concern that drug manufacturers are charging more in the United States than in other industrialized countries for the same drugs. To shed some light on this issue, in our study, we compared factory prices of drugs bought in retail pharmacies in the United States to the factory prices of similarly purchased drugs in Canada. For our analysis, we gathered information on the 200 drugs most frequently dispensed by U.S. drug stores. We were subsequently able to match 121 drugs according to a specific set of criteria. Using this methodology, we found that when we compared U.S. and Canadian prices, manufacturers generally charge more to wholesalers in the United States than in Canada for identical drugs. As is shown in this first charge on my left, the vast majority of the 121 drugs we studied were more expensive in the United States, and almost half cost over 50 percent more. As a way of summarizing the magnitude of these price differences, we calculated the cost of purchasing a common U.S. prescription of each of the 121 drugs in both the United States and Canada. We found that such a basket of drugs would cost wholesalers 32 percent more in the United States. We also found that U.S. and Canadian drug price differentials for specific products vary widely. The five most commonly dispensed products exemplify the variation in U.S.-Canadian price differentials. As shown in this second chart, Amoxil, the most commonly dispensed product in the United States in 1990, cost only 5 percent more per package in the United States than in Canada. However, the second, third, fourth, and fifth most commonly dispensed products in the United States Lenoxin, Zantac, Premarin, and Xanax cost 16, 30, 162, and 183 percent more per package in the United States than in Canada, respectively. Now, a second aspect of our study was to identify the factors that would explain this variation in drug price differentials. We found they were not due to differences in research, production, or distribution costs. Instead, they can be explained by two factors that manufacturers encounter in Canada that, they do, not, that do not exist in, in the United States. Federal regulations that are designed to uh, restrain prices on patented drugs and provincial drug benefit plans that pay for drugs for a large segment of the population. First, federal efforts to restrain drug prices in Canada rely largely on the actions of a regulatory body known as the Patent Medicine Prices Review Board. Since its inception in 1987, the board has been charged with ensuring that prices on patented drugs are not excessive. And in our work, we found that they have been reasonably successful in accomplishing this. 
Along with this price review board, provincial governments, by virtue of their role as large third-party payers of prescription drug bills, can exert pressure on manufacturers to lower prices. Each of the 12 Canadian provinces and territories has its own drug benefit program. Most of these uh, programs cover drugs used by the elderly and low-income individuals, but in some provinces they cover drugs used by all residents. For example, in Ontario, Canada's most popular, populous province, provincial officials negotiate with manufacturers to determine the prices that the province will pay. This price need apply only to that share of the prescription drug sales covered by the provincial plan, which is about 40 percent. If a manufacturer and a province cannot come to an agreement on the price, the manufacturer can choose not to sell to that share of the market. In addition, if the manufacturer wants to list the price on the formulary, they can also charge a higher price to the private payer. In reality, however, the Ontario price listed on the formulary tends to be the basis for setting prices throughout Canada, possibly because these prices are published in a formulary that's accessible to all payers. In conclusion, our analysis shows that there are large differences in prices charged by manufacturers in Canada and the U.S., that they're due not to differences in costs of research, production, or distribution, but instead can be explained in large part by the impact of the Canadian federal government and its price review board and the concentrated buying power of the drug plans and that power uh, that they can exert on drug manufacturers. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my remarks and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony. I want to uh, compliment you and your colleagues on this very impressive study. There can be no question after this study that the Canadians do pay substantially less for prescription drugs than do Americans. And I've noted from the prepared statement of some of the witnesses who will appear later today that uh, they take issue with some aspects of your study. What I want to ask you is this. There have now been numerous uh, studies on international drug prices. Does any reputable expert contest the consistent findings of these studies, which is that U.S. citizens pay the highest prescription drug prices in the world and that citizens in other countries pay substantially less for the drugs they use than we do? Well, we're not aware of any. The studies that we look at extensive numbers of studies for this uh, in preparing this work and the subsequent work we're doing for you and in looking at international research and comparing prices between Europe and the U.S., Europe and Canada, consistently our drug prices are the highest, regardless of the different methodologies that you might use. I'd like to turn some, to some of the specifics in your study. I, I want to make sure that I understand one of your critical findings. You concluded that the price differences that you found are not accounted for by differences in research, production or distribution costs. Is that correct? That's correct. Instead, you attribute the differences to two factors. The first is efforts in Canada to restrain prices, particularly the Canadian Patented Medicine Prices Review Board. And then you have another a factor, and that is the uh, impact of the uh, formulary. Let me ask you, first of all, about this review board that Canada has. Uh, price increases for individual drugs um, may not uh, exceed the CPI. Is that one of the ways that this review board words works and how else does it hold down the uh, uh, prices of prescription drugs? Right. This, this board, when it was set up, it's a quasi-judicial board and it was charged with a mandate to not let drug prices on patent become excessive. And so it had to set up criteria to define that. And for existing drugs, which means that drugs that were already on the market being sold, if they want to increase their prices, they can increase them basically faster than the rate of the consumer price index. For new drugs, they have to develop some new method for figuring out how to, if a price is excessive. And what they do is they look to see other drugs in the same therapeutic category, and the company then can't price it higher than these other drugs. And if it's a real breakthrough drug and there is no other drug like it on the market, they look internationally and the drug has to be priced at the median of, seven of what seven industrialized countries are reimbursing at. So in other words, this board, which is, is this set up by the government? Yes, it is. Uh, this board uh, 
is able to restrain drug prices, it still look at some of the differences that uh, the public expects from drugs to treat, in other words, breakthrough drugs differently than uh, what so-called Me Too drugs and uh, to compare different drugs that might well accomplish the same purpose. That's right. It tries to split it in different categories so that you're pricing the drugs fairly and giving a fair return to the manufacturer. Do you have any information on what impact this board has on prescription drug prices in Canada? Well, the board's data itself that we looked at showed that they've been able to keep uh, prices for existing drugs rising at a rate lower than inflation. In our analysis, comparing to U.S. prices, we found that they kept the prices for existing drugs about 25 percent lower than they would have been priced if you hadn't had that board. We also tried to look at their impact on new drugs, and that was more difficult because there were fewer of those drugs in our sample. For the drugs that we had, and again, it's a small number, it was about 50 percent lower. The second factor that you uh, allege accounts for this price differential between what U.S. and Canadian citizens pay uh, is the formularies that are adopted in the various provinces. How does that work? Well, these work very much like our large HMOs or hospital buying groups here in the United States, only none are as large as, as the uh, drug formularies in, the United, in, in Canada. And they really exercise the power of the number of people they're buying for to try to get manufacturers to negotiate down to the lowest rate. So and they have the a collective mechanism of pooling together the purchases of drugs in order to get the best uh, buy or better bargain for those consumers. Is that uh, the way That's exactly right. And what they do is they have the manufacturers have to submit a set of data to, to be considered to be on this list of drugs that would be acceptable for reimbursement. And the data are price and volume and efficacy and safety. Um, and then, and they don't always come to agreement on a price. Often the provincial government will try to ratchet the price down and often sometimes that will happen. But in some cases, they don't come to agreement. So in 1991, they dropped about 44 drugs from their formulary. When American consumers buy drugs, if they're elderly, and most consumers of drugs, I, I think, are, well, maybe not most, but like the last figure I saw was something like 20 percent of the purchases of drugs in this country are elderly. If they buy it and they're on Medicare, Medicare doesn't pay for prescription drugs. So it's each individual purchaser on his or her own rather than having the benefit of some collective uh, uh, organization to look out for their interests and to bargain for a better price. Right. And, and that really gets to the focus of our study because some of the uh, questions about methodology really relate to impact of revenues on the industry. Our study is looking at what the elderly person or the individual walking into a retail drugstore would pay and, and that's the, why you see the differential. Mr. McMillan? I think that's uh, one among a number of the problems of your study. You said that you use as a basis for comparison typical retail price in the United States versus typical retail price in Canada. question arises, did you include a retail price in a large chain drugstore as opposed to an individual pharmacy or what? And I throw that out. The other would be, what about volume buying? Um, as I understand it, 10 percent of uh, the U.S. market is a uh, uh, basically benefits under Medicaid rebate laws, 2 percent under veterans uh, pricing. Uh, some 35 percent of our uh, pharmaceuticals are sold through negotiated discounts to HMOs, hospital buying groups, mail order pharmacies, etc. If you simply use a, uh, what you call a typical retail price as a basis of comparison with all these other good things you say about Canada, then we, you know, we don't, we're not compare, we're comparing apples and avocados. And so I submit that is one of the problems. The other I'd like to get into and focus a little bit on is the whole issue of generic drugs. As I understand, some 30 percent of the U.S. market is gen generic, and none of the generic prices in the United States were used in comparison with Canada. Um, um, if you, I have a list here of a long list of all items that you use in your study which are, show the comparisons that you have between the Canadian and the U.S. Uh, 
price, so-called U.S. retail price, but then it also includes the generic price, which you don't include. And in almost every instance, the U.S. generic price is less than Canada. Now, um, how do you explain that? Or uh, number one, or number two, why didn't you include that? 30% of our market is generics and seems to be increasingly moving in that direction. Uh, admittedly, it does not probably uh, call for the kind of advertising expenses uh, that would be associated with uh, brand name product, but um, certainly would include the um, research and development costs that went into that, I would assume. Um, I have a few more questions, but if you would care to respond to either of those first two, I would appreciate it. I'd be happy to. The first uh, question you asked, uh, why didn't we include the Medicaid rebates or the large discounts that wholesalers get or if they're like a, a large HMO or a hospital? That's a different study. That study looks at the impact of all of these things going on on the revenues of the drug industry. This study is looking at the impact of drug prices on the individual cash paying consumer who walks into a retail drugstore. And so what we did, to, and that's about 70 to 80 percent of all prescription purchases are coming from the individual buying prescription drugs at the drugstore. And so what we did... Those, I've been in the uh, retail drug business. Um, the, the price varies considerably from one to the other. There's that's no right. And that's why we didn't use the retail price, because there is some variability. But I'm we were the trying... The retail varies from store to store. That's um, right. I don't want to use company names, but, uh, you know, the price at Eckerd's is uh, just considerably different than... Mm -hmm. Uh, the ABC pharmacy that operates a single store. And that's why we used uh, manufacturer's price, because there is some variability at the retail level, but our focus was on the cash paying consumer uh, and, and the impact of prices on that individual, which is about 70 to 80 percent of purchases of all prescriptions. And so what we analyzed was the manufacturer's component of the price in the retail drugstore paid by the typical consumer, and we matched that manufacturer's price in the U.S. to Canada. So we really are comparing apples to apples because our focus is on the consumer uh, and purchasing at the retail drugstore. Well, why wouldn't you use a weighted average based upon, uh, just as a case in point, upon buying patterns? If 30% of the public's buying generics in that retail setting, why don't you, why don't you use that? We would have pattern? very much liked to have gotten um, that kind of data. So we could have done that and we could do that analysis, but as you know, almost all this data is uh, proprietary and we tried to get the information and you cannot get it. Um, so it's, it is hard to do these uh, studies. Therefore, we picked the top 200 prescriptions uh, dispensed by drugstores in the United States in 1990. That represents over 54 percent of all pres prescriptions dis uh, dispensed. So we, we think we are picking a representative sample of the major set of prescriptions that, a, that an individual um, is going to buy. Well, if you just take those, of, I think those are ranked in some order, three over there, the, the the generic discount to the Canadian price is rather substantial, 50 percent, 50 percent, 50 percent in the case of uh, Amoxyl, 50 percent in the case of uh, Lenoxin, 33 percent in the case of Premarin. Right. We did not look at generics in this country, I mean in this study, because we were analyzing our methodology in response to the committee's request was to, to compare price differentials between uh, uh, prescription drugs sold in the United States and sold in, in Canada. And most of our uh, generic companies typically sell in the United States, so it would be hard to get a comparison, number one. And number two, um, we were looking at exact identical products so that we could try to wash away a lot of these methodological differences, because other studies in the past, if you haven't used the exact product, the generic I is... I think those three are identical, and there are a lot more in, in a longer right. list that I have. Mm -hmm. And I bring this up to say that we, the, the object here is to look at this thing objectively. Yes. If you look at a basically a free market system in, a, in contrast to one that's not, 
um, you're going to see some distortions, but you need to look at the entire market and not just pieces of it. And I would conclude on one further comment. How many of the pharmaceuticals marketed in Canada were developed in Canada where the research and development costs are, have to be included in the uh, marketing costs within Canada itself? Gentlemen, time but we'll let the witness uh, respond to it. Well, well my, my point would be there that a, a number of pharmaceuticals may have been developed uh, under free market economies where uh, the research and development cost has to be recovered. And, and quite frankly, I'm sure a lot of companies operating in an international market are going to have to recover the cost where they can. And if one market is simply ratcheting down the price uh, you know, on a certain product, then it's going to have to go recover it in some other way. And I think you need to take that sort of thing into account. Well, I think that we did say that, and we don't take an opinion on any of these things, we did say that uh, if you, if you, when our analysis showed that if you compared two prices, um, the, betw between Canada and the U.S., we found that it was a direct government intervention in Canada plus the provincial uh, buying groups were the reason for the lower price. In, in Canada. Then, Mr. Mr. Wyden. Thank you, Chairman. Ms. Scheichel, you have a very difficult job because it's quite obvious to me that the same drug companies that are complaining about your methodology won't give you the information that you need to make the most precise analysis with respect to pricing, and I appreciate your doing what you can. Now, one point that later witnesses make is that drug companies charge pharmacies that serve consumers one price but they give discounts to other large purchasers such as hospitals, HMOs, and insurance companies. Is data on, this, uh, on these discounts available in our country? No, it's not. Actually, we tried to get that information and we're not able to obtain it. Um, actually, you know, even the data that we use, the manufacturer's data, uh, in the U.S. we had to purchase. So it's very difficult to... Uh, and probably impossible for a consumer to get this information. Which, which companies did you try to get the data from? Uh, I could supply that. We tr I think we contacted could, could all... A, could you name a couple of companies for the record? Because I, I feel very strongly about this. My colleague from North Carolina is absolutely right that this issue has got to be looked at objectively. And I personally want to un unleash real market forces mm -hmm. so that people can, uh, can see the fruits of competition. But that's not possible when you can't get pricing data. And I think it's real clear that you can't get good pricing data in this country, but you can in Canada. And I'd like to know which companies, or at least a few of them, you went to to try to get this information so that maybe they wouldn't have complained so much about the methodology. Perhaps I might respond. Um, while uh, I don't recall the uh, precise companies that, uh, individual companies that we talked to, uh, I know that we did talk to uh, a number of companies, about a half dozen, uh, extensively uh, in uh, early phases of our work, uh, and subsequently we, we've talked to a number of companies. We also had uh, very uh, helpful general conversations with the Pharmaceuticals Manufacturers Association um, and had asked them uh, to help us in uh, getting more data. Um, but uh, to date, uh, we haven't been did, able to did get Did members that. of the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association deny you access to this pricing data? Ms. Scheichel? Yes. Oh, of, the, of PMA? Yeah. You mean, oh, I don't know that we contacted PMA. Well, well, no, no, member no, companies. Oh, what member I, companies. What I want to find out is whether the larger companies, mm -hmm. the ones that were, are part of the PMA, were stiffing you on this pricing data. And my understanding is that those were the companies. Is that correct? I think so. We'll, we will check our records. It's my we contacted almost every major company, company to obtain this information and we're not able to. Uh, this is considered proprietary data. They do not want to supply it to you. Um, I can tell you in our previous study also that we were trying to look at rebate effects. We had uh, we spent a year trying to get the data and had to guarantee confidentiality. It's not available publicly. But in Canada, it is available publicly. Yes, it is. The, it was, you can get the manufacturer's price data that's on the formulary. This is dispensed widely to drugstores, wholesalers, physicians, hospitals. You can, and it sort of sets the pricing tone. Let me ask you one other question on this round. Mike. Yeah, just for a quick 
a question. Well, I only get about five minutes. If the chairman can give me a little more time allowance, I'd be happy to yield to my colleagues. Well, it's very pertinent. Um, I think under HICWA laws, the company is required to provide such cost information, which you would have had access to. Is that not correct? Uh, we for this study, we would not have access to the data because there's no federal. Um, there would be no federal authority I, I, to I give us ask, data. Ask one other question, since my time is tight. But it seems to me, on this point, the pharmaceutical companies want it both ways. They don't want to give you the data so you can do the most precise study, and they want to complain like crazy then about the methodology. And I hope that we'll have a chance to get good data. Uh, on this uh, issue. Last question I wanted to ask is at home in Oregon, what my constituents are most upset about is why the drug companies have to spend so much on marketing their drugs. And you look at these price differentials, things like Xanax, 183 percent differential. My subcommittee has been investigating Taxol, where there's a huge markup with respect to a drug that essentially sells itself, a drug to fight uh, ovarian cancer. In your view, why do the drug companies have to spend so much money on marketing, and in many instances, marketing drugs that virtually sell themselves? I d we didn't really look at that issue in this study. I don't know. The My time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wyden. Mr. Upton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was very alarmed as I read through this study about uh, the lack of generic understanding, I guess you could say, in, in putting together this study, but I was even more alarmed as I looked through this uh, report and I found a little footnote in the small type and I couldn't quite see the chart that was over there and I don't know if this was on that uh, chart or not, but let me just read footnote 11. Canadian reimbursed price is almost always based on the largest package size of a given drug product sold in Canada. I do represent Kellogg's. I buy cereal in this size. Our study's Canadian factory price per package might therefore understate Canadian versus U.S. package prices where the U.S. price is based on a smaller, relatively more expensive on a per dose basis package size. And I've seen these things made. Now, <laughs> it's my understanding as you look through this study that some of your cost comparisons were based on a 10,000, see a nod, <laughs> uh, 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 pill size versus 100. Now, and your chart that you had up all had 100 on that whole column uh, coming down. But is it accurate that some of the the uh, pill size dosages were in fact in, in uh, 10,000 versus 100 uh, units that, that based doesn't... on this footnote? Um, Package size? I, I, I don't know about a, any particular drug that might have been based on that. The point is that uh, the Canadian uh, uh, source that we use, the Ontario Drug Formulary, uh, bases their prices um, on the largest package size and whatever that might be. Well, that biases so, the study right off. No, uh, the point is that... it's the largest size, I no, mean, the, when I the, go to Giant and Safeway, you, you can see a real comparison, and you acknowledge that in, in your study. Pricing in the U.S. does often vary by package size, and what we did when we were developing the methodology was we tried to find the most common package size that where a drug is dispensed here. Then in Canada, the price per pill doesn't vary by package size uh, like it does here. And so we took into account and made, the adjustments are made so that we really did compare the same uh, price. It's the same issue. It, it, we've taken that into consideration. So that there are really, what you're saying is that this footnote is inaccurate that you have on your, it's on uh, page. I no, I think know, we were just trying to of the appendix. be very, we've been uh, very open about the methodologies and everything we have used uh, to try to be very clear to anyone who wanted to go in and replicate our work or, or do the same kind of study. It's just that you don't have the same pricing approach on prescriptions here that you do there, we've made the adjustments. So we are comparing um, apples to apples here. 
So can, can you then say, therefore, for the record, that the, the cost uh, is uh, per dosage or cost per pill is based on the exact same analysis using the same dosage buys from the phar pharmaceutical firms? Yes. Our comparison is the same. We're comparing the same things. Well, then why, did, why was there a need for this footnote indicating uh, based on the largest package size in Canada versus 100 uh, in the United States? What we were trying to do there was to show that if you were to look at the United States, and instead of doing what we focused on, which was the most common or a most common or a common package size in the United States, you were to look at a less common package size in the United States that happened to be larger. Even if you were to do that, you would still find substantial differentials. The point is, we certainly understand that in the United States, that prices per pill differ often by package size. We wanted to reassure people who might be reading our study that even if you wanted to uh, give the benefit of the doubt, if you would, to, US manu to the U.S. prices, uh, that this did not have a uh, market effect on the qualitative conclusion. It changes the numbers somewhat. We still, though, stand by, we still, excuse me, we still stand by the choice that we made, which is comparing uh, wherever we could, the most common package size in the United States to that in Canada. It happens that in Canada, the, with the ODB, that the price per pill does not vary with the package size. We can't do anything about that. So we compared the same things. That, that's what we're trying to say. Come back. Thank you, Mr. Upton. Uh, Mr. Slattery? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, first of all, let me commend you for, um, for uh, requesting this GAO report. And uh, I join some of my colleagues in observing that there is uh, not an issue out in the country today uh, that inflames senior citizens and others that are required to purchase drugs at the local pharmacy more than this issue of, of the, the cost of drugs and, and their growing awareness that in fact uh, they're paying more in this country for drugs than in other parts of the, of the world. Um, the witnesses in the last panel testifying today have a number of criticisms of the, of the GAO study, and I'd like to give you all an opportunity to respond to some of those criticisms before we hear this afternoon from, uh, from some of the other panelists. Um, first, Dr. Lane of Merck uh, will argue that exchange rates can explain the international drug uh, price differences. He gives an example of a recently introduced Merck drug, which was uh, introduced at roughly the same price around the world, but which now has significantly different prices in different countries due to the differences in the exchange rate. Uh, first of all, I'm wondering, is this a valid criticism of your study? Well, this is not a valid criticism. Uh, we took 121 drugs. And those drugs were all introduced at many, you know, over a long time span where exchange rates go up and down. And most research, our research, suggests that, that that's not a significant component in price variability. You know, John can give you an example of where no, it can... This is with Canada, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, and it... it but do you have data dealing with, with uh, other countries around the no, world? No, no, I, I was going to say that... If you had introduced a drug between uh, 87 and, why don't you explain it? For Canada, um, it's, you can pick the year and you can get your result. And this is true really in general. So if, for example, you picked um, a drug that was introduced between 86 and 91 and uh, the Canadian price and Canadian dollars stayed the same, uh, the movement in the exchange rate would make that drug more expensive in U.S. dollars. So uh, that's a case where uh, you get the opposite result from one where, based on movements in exchange rates, it can go the other way. Our point is that there's no particular reason to think that for a large number of drugs introduced over a wide number of years that uh, there would be a particular bias one way or the other. It may have some effect on some particular drugs, but we don't have any information that would suggest that this changes the qualitative conclusion that we have. Okay. 
Uh, Mr. Mossinghoff will state in, on page 10 of his prepared testimony that your report compares the lowest discounted price in Canada with the highest sticker price in the United States. Uh, Dr. Brent, who will join Mr. Mossinghoff on, on the last panel, makes the same point on page four of his testimony. And uh, in your opinion, is this um, a valid criticism of your study? No, that's not. We what we did in this study is to compare the factory component of the price in a retail drugstore that the average consumer pays. And we compared that factory component uh, price in the U.S. to the factory component of the price in the same market in Canada. And what we did is we acquired... So to, to, to put this in layman's language, you were trying to compare what a consumer pays in this country with what a consumer pays in Canada. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. And to do that, we, ha we took the price the drug companies sell to wholesalers, which is about three-fourths of that price the consumer pays, and we compared that price to the same price in Canada. Um, and we found the factory price in Canada and matched it to the factory price here. So their argument, I think they're misunderstanding the uh, methodology, but we've tried to be very clear about it. Mm -hmm. uh, their point is wrong. So you're, you're confident that when you make the point that, that for example, with, uh, with uh, Primarin, that uh, the price that you cite in this country uh, of 2647 is the price that the consumers in this country are paying. Is that what you're telling me? Well, you would add the retail market to that, and okay. then you would get the consumer's price. Mm -hmm. Right. And in fact, um, you know, none of the drug companies have challenged uh, the prices that we have cited. None of them have challenged these prices? No. So, so in that instance, then you have $10.10 .10 being the Canadian price versus $26.47 in this country. Okay, could I have one, one additional minute there? I'm just curious, did you take like this particular drug, Primarin, and really get into that, that and look at it and try and figure out exactly why this is going on? I mean, it's uh, one thing to look at all these drugs sort of generally and say right. there's, there's a, a significant cost differential, but did you look at like one particular drug and just really get into it in detail to determine exactly why that is the case? No, we didn't. What we did do that, that I think is interesting is that if you, when we looked at all these drugs and just compared them, the price differential here and the, to Canada, when you looked at the, you, and we sorted out the impact of the Canadian Prices uh, Review Board and the, Cana uh, drug buy, the provincial buying groups. But for those drugs in Canada that weren't under the control of the, of the Price Review Board or the drug, provincial drug buying group, they were priced very close to what I the drugs are priced here, mm -hmm. which would give you a, a Chairman, reason for the difference. I'm just wondering if, if uh, there's been any similar study done on prosthesis equipment uh, manufactured in this country and, and marketed around the world. Mm -hmm. I have orthopedic surgeons who have, who have expressed to me their, their absolute outrage with the fact that they have to pay twice or three times as much for a, for a artificial knee, for example, or a hip replacement uh, prosthesis in this country as, as, it, as those things cost in, in Germany or in, in, in uh, London, and they're made in this country in many cases. And I'm just curious if you've done any research on that. I'm, I'm not familiar. We can check for you. Our prices in general for health care, throughout the health care industry, tend to be higher. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Slattery. Mr. Greenwood? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It seems to me that when we get to the bottom of all this, the real issue that we have to decide from a policy point of view is, is there excess profit taking, as however that might be defined in, in this country where it's not occurring in, in Canada. Does your study give you any information about the relative differences in profitability for these 121 products as they are sold in Canada versus at the prices they're sold in this country? No. Okay. Was that not part of your task in this, in this study at all? We it, just not asked you the right questions in order for us to get the answer 
answers we need as to whether or not there is there is excess profitability it was we were not asked to look at that issue and we focused all our attention uh, uh, in trying to develop a methodology just to compare the difference in prices and what might explain the differences do you know anything about the level of profitability in Canada for these 121 products versus the level of profitability in this country I don't know that we do it's a very different drug industry in Canada okay I think that um, it's hard to uh, allocate profitability uh, between different markets for the same company um, there are lots of accounting things that would go on there. The Office of Technology Assessment is looking at the general issue of profitability and rate of return uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, that's a massive study and uh, far beyond the scope of this one. But we didn't look at that. Thank you. One of the uh, earlier questioners asked you if there was any competent uh, expert who disagreed with the findings uh, of your report. Uh, it's my understanding that, that, um, that you consulted with Professor Schondelmeyer, is it, in the uh, creation of this um, uh, report. I'm aware of a statement that he's made. He says, this is a quote from him. He says, the U.S. General Accounting Office found that when similar prescription medicines in Canada and the U.S. are compared on price, cash pay citizens in the, in the United States pay about one-third more than Canadians do. These findings were reevaluated for this report to determine what might be learned from the Canadian perspective. Figure 10 shows that compared to the U.S. price for a drug, Canadian prices were 12.2 percent lower. So he seems to be disputing, uh, although you relied upon him for your methodology in this report, uh, he seems to be disputing uh, your findings. And instead of saying that, uh, concluding that there's a 32 difference, 32 percent difference in price, He's uh, seeing a 14% difference in price. Can you respond to that? Yes, um, I just learned that, and I mean, I, I just talked to him before the hearing started, and so I haven't had a chance to look at this testimony. But he indicated that that's totally erroneous; that it was taken out of context, and it's dealing with a different issue. And I know he'll be on the panel later, and he could respond. But he's saying that that's not correct. His, uh, this is, I think, a quote from his testimony. He says, the GAO found that when similar prescription medicines in Canada and the U.S. are compared on price, cash-paying citizens in the United States pay about one-third more than Canadians do. The GAO study compared the top 200 retail prescription medicines on price in Canada and the United States. Those findings were re-evaluated for this report to determine what might be learned from the Canadian perspective. Figure 10 shows that Compared to the U.S. price for a drug, Canadian prices were 12.2 percent lower. Canadian single-source drugs were only 4.9 percent lower than the U.S. price, while multiple-source Canadian drugs were 22 percent, 22.6 percent lower than the U.S. price. So, that seems to be quite at variance with your report. Well, I just learned about that this morning. He tells I haven't seen his analysis, and he. He indicates that he is analyzing something different and that that's an, not an accurate portrayal of his results. He totally agrees with the results of our study. Would and you be willing to um, make available to the committee staff the, the, uh, the raw data and, and, the, and the work material that went into this study so that we can look at it and, and evaluate it to make sure that uh, it leads us to the same conclusions to which it's led you? Absolutely. In fact, uh, after we released the study, we met with all the drug companies, and in fact, we turned over our computer analysis uh, to Pfizer, and it, it's my understanding that they then gave it to a professor who's going to be testifying today. Um, so we have made our methodology and data available to everyone, um, but, but I haven't seen that analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Greenwood. Mr. Washington? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, Madam Director, is it pronounced? I'm down on the end over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's quite all right. I, I came in late. I, I apologize for, for not being. You thought the voice was coming from the sky. <laughs> I'm you have that, that kind of sentence. voice, too. <laughs> uh, is it pronounced cycles? Cycles. Okay. 
Um, I think this is very important work that you've done and obviously very timely. Um, Thank you. And that um, the people in this country have the very issue that uh, you have addressed uh, in the forefront of their minds that it relates not only to prescription drugs in general, but to health care. And so I thank you for the work that you've done. It seems to me that we could find lots of ways to, to be critical of the work that you've done, but I personally find absolutely indefensible. I would not presume to attempt to defend a difference in price if there is none. Um, and we're here to determine if there is a difference in price, and if so, what action should be taken. And we can pick your study apart, it seems to me, um, uh, pick at it like one does at uh, a woven sweater. But the bottom line is whether it's 20% uh, or 4% or 10%, uh, I don't think that any of my colleagues would want to be put in a position of defending um, a difference in price when it is their constituents and consumers who are paying that difference. And so let me ask you a couple of questions, please. Did you find that because, and, and I'm relating now to your study and to the conclusions that you draw, and there's a summary of the conclusions in the front, where you seem to suggest uh, that there are market constraints that exist in, in Canada's review board and the like that, that uh, along with other things, um, account for the difference in price. Is that a fair assessment? That's a very fair assessment. Okay, then. Did you find that as a result of the different market forces or the review process, uh, the restraints or constraints that have been placed on the price of drugs in Canada, that there was an absence from that market, a conspicuous absence from that market of certain pharmaceutical companies that do business in the United States. You mean in terms of the drugs available or, or just the companies themselves? Both. I don't think we found any lack of drugs being sold. Um, you mean they're willing to sell? They're willing to be forced to sell their drugs for less in Canada? Yes. So, I understand there's going to be someone here later from several companies, and, and I will ask them, and I'm sure they're present so they can be prepared to answer. Upjohn Company does business in Canada? Yes. Pfizer does business in Canada? It's my understanding. I mean, we, f we were able to match all of our top selling prescriptions to the uh, same identical drug from the same company in Canada. So our top 200 drugs, we were able to match in Canada. So you mean the, so the same, same companies formulation, are the exact same drug that is produced either here or there or some other place and then, sold, right. and then sold in both countries sold by the same company. That's right. That's why we didn't include generics, because we didn't want some debate about whether it was the same exact product. So it's the identical product by the same company. That would be the only way to make a fair comparison. That's then. right. So one would then have to conclude that they were, they were willing, that is, these companies, were willing to sell the same drug at a lower price in Canada, then they were either willing or able to sell it for in the United States. Yes. Excuse me just a moment. So, excuse me, I, uh, um, I'm out of time. Let me, well, may I just get one last question? The gentleman, question? Uh, we've been uh, pretty liberal on the time, so why don't you go ahead and... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've, I've just about completed the thought. So then, the, the people back in Houston, Texas, where I'm from, 
then could conclude that <coughs> without all of the, the mumbo jumbo, whether it's the, the, the cost that goes into developing new drugs, research and development, that, that we all, of course, want and need in order that new project products can be used in experimental stage and then made available to the consumer, uh, which is an item of overhead, of course. The, the cost of um, packaging, the cost of labeling, the cost of, of advertising, all of these things then are being born if these are items that account for the differences. Then, then John Willie Earl in Houston, Texas would have to arrive at the conclusion that he is paying more for research and development and labeling and advertising than his counterpart in Canada for the same drug. That's right. You're, here you, the, your resident is paying more for a prescription drug for the same prescription drug that he could buy in or she could buy in Canada and the major reason is because the Canadian government has determined that they are going to keep the prices for drugs lower and the provincial buying groups make sure that manufacturers keep the prices lower than here. And, and the, the Those are the main reasons. The manufacturers are willing to put up with that in Canada. Yes, but they, they are. But they holler and scream about it here. Is that right? They are willing to put up with it in Canada. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Bliley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Isn't it true that many of the drugs uh, you studied, uh, and I believe you answered this before, but I, it's part of a line of question I want to develop. Uh, the drugs you studied are available in U.S. in generic form? Yes, some of them. And aren't the uh, U.S. generic versions of these products 30, 40, or 50, or even as much as 80 percent cheaper than the Canadian prices uh, that you report? I think generic prices are often up to 50 percent cheaper. Um, it's certainly true that in the United States that the generic prices tend to be lower than the branded name price. Uh, we did not look at generics in our study and did not compare the differential well, between the... Well, what was the your rationale me. for this? Uh, the rationale was that we were interested in, first, in the cash paying market for the uh, U.S. consumer, and secondly, in trying to isolate the role of the manufacturer as opposed to the wholesaler or retailer uh, in the pricing that's observed. If, since the generics often are not produced by the same company in the U.S. and Canada, those things were dropped from our sample. If a generic oh. happened to be produced in, uh, by the same company in the U.S. and Canada, it would be included in our study. Did you? Do you know that on average, or do you know what the uh, percentage of prescriptions uh, written in the U.S. are for generic drugs? Uh, offhand, I don't. Would the um, number 40 percent uh, surprise you? I think that would be high, but I, I don't know. You think it would be high, but you don't have any way of knowing whether it could be 50 or 60 percent, right, from your study? Well, it's much lower than that, but well, we what do, what, can... What do you base it on? What You say it's much lower. What do you base it on? Uh, no, it's not something that we reported on in our study. What we focused on were uh, brand name products and whether they were being sold at different prices in the two countries. And yeah. we had to exclude generics mainly because we were trying to make sure that we just compared identical products that consumers purchase and there's enough difference in the generics that we decided to exclude them. I, I think they're about 30 percent, I'm not sure, but we didn't deal with that in our study. We focused on the brand name products that an individual walking into a, a drugstore would buy in here or in Canada. All right. Uh, in, I'm curious, do you know how many of the 121 products in the GAO study were developed in Canada? No, I don't. Actually, I don't think any of them were developed in Canada. I see. 
Uh, if, in if fact, it's already very small. In fact, I understand that Canada has not produced any major drugs in a long time. Is that true? As I understand that, that's true, yes. Well, the reason I ask that is, isn't it possible that if the United States adopted a pharmaceutical policy similar to Canada's, that the U.S. level of research would decline? I Possibly the levels commensurate with those found in Canada? I think we tried to be very clear in the study of what we were doing and what we were not doing. And, and uh, we did say that we in no way were trying to look at if you took our findings and um, um, took the same, applied the same regulatory approach and buying power approach in Canada to the U.S., what the impact would be on our industry because uh, Canada does not have the same thriving innovative industry that we have and it's a much and it's also a much smaller market than our market as ours is the largest drug market so we tried to be very clear that we were not addressing those issues all we were reporting on what we found was that the same drug is sold by the same company at very different prices in the two countries and that does have an impact on our consumers and the difference is because of government regulation we were not advocating government regulation we're just saying that explains the difference thank you thank you mr chairman thank you very much mr bliley uh, we've completed a round of questions by all the members of the subcommittee and we have other witnesses waiting but if members do want to ask another question or two uh, I'll recognize them at this time before we uh, dismiss the uh, witness. Mr. Wyden. I'll, I'll be very brief, Mr. Chairman. I just want to. I just want to understand the chart that several of my colleagues are using on the minority uh, side, because it seems to me the chart over there is being used to highlight the uh, idea that there really isn't that great a price differential in drugs between uh, the two uh, countries, and my reading of the chart, and I need my colleagues on the minority to uh, enlighten me on this, is that it seems to compare the price of Canadian brand names to the price of U.S. generics. Is that the case? And if so, it seems to me we wouldn't have an apples and apples comparison. But as I say, I'm not certain of this, and I'd like my colleagues to tell me whether this chart does in fact compare the price of Canadian brand names to the price of U.S. generics. There are no uh, generic equivalents in the Canadian market, as I understand it. So I, I'm correct in that regard? No, I don't think you are correct. Uh, I think the whole problem with the study is that, it's, it, that it segments one component of the U.S. market and compares it with the entire Canadian market. And the American market is very diverse with a lot of different approaches to marketing and and distribution, and uh, it's erroneous to simply use a worst-case method uh, in, uh, in making the comparison. So this is a t an attempt to at least indicate that uh, some 30 percent of the U.S. market that generics represent is uh, quite competitive with the Canadian regulated price, in fact, is substantially below it. But aren't, aren't these Canadian brand names and the U.S. drugs are U.S. generics? Well, they're, they're generic equivalents, and I don't know whether those are Canadian or U.S. brand names. Which are they? They're U.S. brand names. So those are competitive in the American market as well as the Canadian market. Well, I, uh, I very much want to see apples and apples comparisons, but uh, it sure looks like that's not what we see on that chart, but we're going to, I know, want to explore this further. The proof is in the pudding, and the pudding's in the pill. And uh, so the, the comparative... And the, and, and, and without mixing metaphors, <laughs> the, the, the General Accounting Office has said that for exactly the same pill, exactly the same pill, the U.S. consumer gets hit an awful lot harder than does the Canadian consumer. The gentleman's, gentleman's time has expired. Any other members seek uh, recognition for any last-minute questions before we move on? Mrs. Slattery? Just for additional couple of seconds. Um, I, I am also a little bit confused about the uh, last exchange between uh, members. Maybe someone can explain to me this chart also dealing with Primarin. Now, as I look at this chart, you have listed the price as the U.S. price is $26.47. The Canadian price for the same drug is $10.10. .10. Is that right? Am I reading this right? 
you, you want to direct that to the witness? Well, I'll direct it to anybody that knows anything about this chart. <laughs> it's not my chart. <laughs> okay. I'm just curious if we're looking at this chart. I mean, that is an enormous price differential as I'm reading the chart. Well, I think the first two columns were derived from... Excuse me. The first two columns were derived from the GAO's figures. Now, I don't know whether, they, whether they're accurate or not. Well, well, the, those, well are the, me... those are the figures in this <laughs> chart that the GAO has developed, okay? The, the first two. Okay, let me explain something, though, because this is a new chart to me, too. But the 1010, for example, on Primarin is actually not the uh, generic price in Canada. That's the wholesaler's price. So if we wanted to do a study comparing gene U.S. generic prices, we, and then you'd only look at the market that's off patent, which excludes all those drugs on patent, you, would, you should compare um, U.S. generic prices, of which there are many, to Canadian prices, uh, generic prices. The prices in our chart are not generic prices. I, I understand. Pardon me? Is there a generic product in There's Canada? There's a huge generic uh, industry in Canada. Is it priced differently than the regular product? Yes, it is. Much now, lower. Now, my understanding, and based on what Mr. Ratner said earlier, is that, in fact, you did look at some generics. Is that correct? They're not included in our study. What did Mr. Ratner say? Uh, my, my point was simply that uh, if a generic in the United States were manufactured by the same company, Right. Let's say Merck manufactured it for the generic market in the United States uh, and, and in, in Canada, Canada, then we would have included that in our analysis because we're interested in, in effect, controlling for the manufacturer, making sure that the, manu the same manufacturer and is involved. What did your studies show on those points? Uh, to be honest, this is a, uh, a very rarefied point. I have not examined, I didn't examine. Uh, our data to, to see exactly whether there is such a, a case. But it would be, my, my assumption is that that's a, a very rare animal indeed. Could, could you take this, a look at that and, and, and provide that to us for the record just so that we understand exactly what, if Merck is marketing a generic in, or manufacturing a generic in this country and it's being marketed here, what is that being sold for in Canada? I mean, it would be interesting to have that information on the generics. Would you yield Yes, would, but I'm out of time. So. Well, the chairman's out quick. of time, and yes. the chair will recognize yes. Mr. McMahon. Yes. Just, I would simply say that in a price-regulated market, the incentive to produce generics is not there. Therefore, um, it's, it's not likely that a very significant proportion of the Canadian market is generics, as such it is in the United States. Actually, Canada has a very large generic market. How much? Uh, what share of the market? I don't know the share of the market, but it's quite Is substantial. Is it 30% like the United States? It's possible it's as large or greater than the United States. I can get that information for you for the record at another I time. I think that would certainly improve your um, study. But they do have a, a very substantial market, and part of the way that the, um, the formularies use that leverage uh, by having generic products um, that can compete against other products, and until very recently, um, 1987, Canada had very weak patent laws that would um, virtually negate patent protection. Generics would come on the market almost immediately in return for a uh, royalty fee paid to the manufacturer. And recent changes in the Canadian law have done away with that, but they have a history of promoting generics, of a very strong generic industry. It's mostly dominated by two firms, which could explain the higher prices. That It's possible that our generic industry is more competitive than their generic industry but they do have a very substantial generic market. I think the main point, though, is we did not, their generic prices are lower than the manufacturer's prices for Canada that we list in this report. So if you want to compare uh, the generic prices in Canada, I mean, if you want to compare our generic prices, you have to, we have to give you a different set of prices, uh, lower prices than the one we listed because they're, they're different. They're lower. If I can just recognize myself, it seems to me that this chart, which was prepared by the Republican minority of our committee, seems to argue that because you compared brand name prices, often by the same drug manufacturer sold to Canadians versus so that sold to Americans, that you didn't do a, a good job because you should have looked at generics. But the reality is that they have generics in Canada, and those generics are as cheap, if not cheaper, than our generics. And the other reality is that most consumers, even when there are generics on the market, buy the brand name drug. Right. So it certainly doesn't uh, in any way undercut your, your study, which without any kind of uh, 
dispute in my mind indicates that American consumers for a brand name drug manufactured by the same company is paying more for that drug than a Canadian consumer. Is that that's, an accurate statement? That's, that totally summarizes our study. The, we matched identical products from the same manufacturer and, the, and then you saw the difference in prices being sold. Well, that really is the bottom line as far as I'm concerned. And we're going to hear later today that you didn't look at exchange rates and that you didn't look at uh, comparing uh, the package size and you've responded to some of these complaints already or that uh, you only considered a selected non-random sample even though you did in fact take the 200 largest selling uh, drugs. Right. Uh, it just seems to me the bottom line is Americans are paying more for the same drug uh, that a Canadian is paying and uh, we have to ask ourselves is that right for the American people? And I thank you very much for your testimony. And we've got other witnesses who are going to go into this whole uh, matter further. Yes. Well, the Sorry. other panelists coming up, could I ask a question of uh, Mr. McMillan? The uh, gentleman won't be recognized for that point okay. because it seems to me that this is a hearing to hear okay. from witnesses okay. rather than to debate uh, yeah. among ourselves. We'll have a chance to do that later. Yeah. Our next. Uh, witnesses will appear as a panel. Ronald Pollack is executive director of the Families USA Foundation. The foundation has been concerned about the rising cost of prescription drugs and their effect on the availability of health care. Mr. Pollack will report to us on the impact of high drug prices on the decision of many Americans to purchase life-saving medications in Mexico. Turner Aspie is a resident from Idaho who has traveled to Mexico to purchase less costly medications to treat his wife Roberta's asthma. Robert Dressing is president of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and has a son with CF. And Dodie Gant is from Virginia and will testify about the struggle of a close friend who recently died of breast cancer. I want to welcome each of you to hear our hearing today and thank those of you who have traveled some distance and uh, taken time off from work and other activities to be with us. We uh, uh, welcome your input into this di discussion. When uh, you've prepared a written statement, that written statement is going to be made part of the record in its entirety. What we'd like to ask each of you to do is to uh, give us your oral presentation and try to limit that to uh, no more than five minutes. Mr. Pollack, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to testify before you and the subcommittee. Uh, and I'm pleased that uh, Mr. Turner Ashby uh, has been willing to join us, uh, travel from uh, Emmett, uh, Idaho. Uh, in September 1992, uh, we issued a report about the top 20 prescription drugs uh, I have given a summary about that report in my written testimony. I will not do so here, although I'm delighted to respond to any questions uh, about that study. Uh, instead, in the five minutes that uh, have been allocated to me, I'm going to focus on uh, uh, surveys that we took, uh, rather informal surveys, both in uh, Canada and the United States and uh, Mexico and the United States. Uh, in the first uh, survey, you will find on uh, uh, table one of my uh, testimony, uh, we surveyed uh, pharmaceutical uh, 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 drugstores in uh, the two nations' capitals in Ottawa, Canada, and in Washington, D.C. Uh, and you'll see on, on table number one uh, what the uh, differential was with respect to uh, the prices. Uh, Zantac. Uh, for ulcers, the average cost in Washington, D.C., uh, we're talking retail now, was $107.11 for uh, 60 tablets. In Ottawa, uh, $67.33, um, very substantial differential. Uh, Mevacor for cholesterol in, the United, in uh, Washington was $67.84, in Ottawa, $55.04. Perhaps uh, the most striking difference was for Xanax, uh, where the average price was $61.66 in uh, the pharmacies here in Washington. Uh, with respect to the pharmacies in Ottawa, uh, the uh, average price was $22.44 <clears throat> for almost a three-to-one uh, 
uh, differential. And I should uh, make clear that we took into account the exchange rate uh, when we did this shopping. So these are equivalent dollar uh, figures uh, based on the uh, exchange rate differential at the time we did this shopping uh, in November of 1992. In addition, Mr. Chairman, uh, when we did our report, uh, which we released in December, uh, crossing the border to Mexico, which focused on people going to Mexico for health care, one component of that report focused on uh, the differential in prescription drug costs uh, in the United States uh, versus uh, Mexico. And I should say to you that when we did this uh, uh, study, uh, this survey, I should say, uh, we looked at uh, various neighboring communities on both sides of the border. And I would suggest to you that when you do so, the differential is not, not quite as great as it would be uh, for a city like Washington, D.C. in Mexico or New York City uh, versus Mexico because you've got some constraint in pricing because you can go just across the border. We looked at three sets of communities. Uh, we looked at Nogales, Arizona, uh, versus Nogales, Mexico. We looked at uh, two communities in California, uh, Calexico and El Centro, California, uh, with a neighboring community of Mexicali uh, in Mexico. And then we looked at uh, two neighboring communities, El Paso, Texas, and Las Cruces, New Mexico, uh, with a neighboring community across the border, Juarez, Mexico. And again, these are retail prices. All of these prices are adjusted for the exchange rate. And uh, if I may uh, refer you to table number two, you will see what the differential is for Nogales, Arizona versus Nogales, Mexico. Zantac, for example, and you'll see the stores where we did our purchasing. Uh, the average uh, price for Zantac uh, on the U.S. side of the border was $89.96. Uh, on the Mexico side of the border, it was $20.77, more than a four-fold differential. Look at cardism used for heart and angina. Uh, the average price on the U.S. side of the border was $21.04. The average price on the New Mexico side of the border was $6.28, more than a three-fold difference. Look at Seaclor. Uh, the average price on the U.S. side of the border was $33.32. On the Mexico side of the border, it was $8.60, almost a fourfold difference. Uh, Tagamet for ulcers, uh, the average price was $78.65. On the Mexico side of the border, $17.99. I would refer you then also to tables three and table four. Table three uh, shows you what the differences were in Calexico and El Centro, California, versus Mexicali in Mexico. Again, uh, Zantac, more than a fourfold difference. Uh, Cardism, almost a fourfold difference. Seaclor, a fourfold difference. Tagamet, more than a fourfold difference. Again, I would refer you to table number four, uh, which will show you the prices in El Paso, Texas, and Las Cruces, New Mexico versus Juarez, Mexico, the neighbor town just across the border. Zantac, uh, the differential was four and a half times. Uh, for Cardism, uh, more than three and a half times. Seaclor, more than four times. Tagamet, more than four times. Uh, Xanax, approximately four and a half times. And let me just conclude, Mr. Chairman, by saying one of the most interesting things that we saw was a little town called Algodones, uh, Mexico. And Algodones is a little town a little, in a little oasis about 30 miles from Yuma, and it looks like a movie set. And it owes its existence to the fact that people in the United States are looking for an outlet to buy cheaper prescription drugs. There are billboards as you go outside Yuma, Texas, uh, Yuma, Arizona on Interstate 8 that beckon you to come to Algodones so that you can get cheaper drugs. And all they have in Algodones are prescription drug stores, eyeglasses and uh, stores, and uh, dental stores. Uh, it is a major way that seniors buy their prescription drugs. And Mr. Ashby, 
uh, is one of those people. I would suggest to you, Mr. Chairman, that Al Gadones stands as a monument to price gouging of American consumers by prescription drug companies. Al Gadones owes its very existence to greed-based pricing in America and the need for Americans to find a safety valve for such unaffordable costs. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pollack. Mr. Aspey, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, there's a button on the base of that mic. If you push it forward, it'll be on. Good. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Turner Ashby, and I'm from... Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Turner Ashby, and I'm from Emmett, Idaho. I'm happy to be here today with Family USA on behalf of my wa wife, Roberta, and myself to talk about the problem that really bothers us, the high cost of prescription drugs. <clears throat> I worked hard my whole life as a mason and a truck driver for an oil company in Pennsylvania. I did my masonry in the warmer months and drove the truck when it got cold. Then in 1989, I got hurt on the job and had to retire. I hurt my back and I've had three operations and I'm generally okay now if I don't do too much. So now I'm 64 years old and receive Social Security disability, plus a little pension from the oil company. Roberta, who is 67 years old <clears throat> and who used to work in sales as an electronic distributor, gets her Social Security. Together, our income is about $1,600 a month. It's tight, but we do okay. What makes it possible was that we decided to move from Pennsylvania to Idaho after I got hurt because the cost of living in Idaho seemed a lot more affordable. We have a nice mobile home in Emmett, and we are doing okay. <clears throat> the one thing that really gets us, though, is health care costs, especially prescription drugs. When I was working, we had a good health coverage, and it was very important to us because Roberta has a very serious asthma illness leaves her pretty weak and sometimes puts her in the hospital but if it weren't for her asthma she'd be here with me today and you can be sure she'd be doing most of the talking but generally she's able to keep her asthma under control with prescription drugs when I was working I had a health insurance through work we were able to get prescriptions she needed and actually only paid one dollar for each one. So I didn't really know what they actually cost, but now we're both on Medicare. We also buy other insurance for each of us because Medicare does not cover a lot of the health problems we may have. But neither Medicare or the other insurance pay prescription. So we have paid for them ourselves. It was a shock to see the real cost was from 300 to 350 dollars a month that we had to pay just for Roberta's asthmatic prescriptions. We did not have any other choice but to pay it. Then a couple of years ago, Roberta was talking to our daughter Peggy, who lives down in Southern California. Peggy suggested that we buy our drugs in Mexico, which was what a lot of folks down there did to be able to afford them. So Roberta checked with her doctor at home and he said that he thought it would be all right and told us what to do. So that's what we decided to do. That winter, it was the winter of 1991 and 1992, we spent three months in Arizona and California. While down there, we went over to a little town of Alcadonas, Mexico and bought a couple of months worth of Roberta's asthmatic medicine and some neprins for my back to see if it would work. The drugs did their job just fine and there were no side effects. So when it came time to come back north, we decided to put together enough money, about $700, to buy a full year's supply of asthmatic medicine. Think of that, about $700 to buy what would cost over $3,500 in the United States. For example, Roberta needs a bronchial inhaler called Intol. It costs about $53 in Idaho, and that's with a 10% senior citizen discount. 
I bought the same thing in Alcadonis for $10.15. Roberta uses another inhaler called Venalin. The cost in Idaho would be $19.25 for the inhaler. We paid $5.32 in Mexico for the same thing. She also needed Venalin solution along with the inhalers for when she's having serious asthma problems. That cost $17.58 in Idaho. I was able to buy it in Mexico for $2.84. Putting it all together, Roberta and I figured we were saving about $2,500 a year in medicines. When you count it all, count in all she needs and what I need, that's a lot of money. To be honest with you, it makes a very big difference to us. If we couldn't buy the prescriptions we needed in Mexico, it would have a hard time, we would have a hard time making it. Now I can't see why there has to be such a big difference in the price of medicines from Mexico to this country. What I'm coming here today to say to you gentlemen is that you have to do something to get this leech off our back. It's absorbing so much of our Social Security dollars that it makes it difficult for a lot of us to have a comfortable life. It would be good once in a while if we could enjoy a good steak and not have to just survive on hamburger. I thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Aspie, for your testimony. Um, Ms. Gant? Be sure to push the button up on the bottom there and pull it close. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I've come here from Virginia Beach, Virginia, on behalf of a friend of mine, a friend of 27 years. For the past 10 years, we were a family through the marriage of her son, my son, and her daughter. Uh, in October, I'm sorry, March of 1986, two things happened to her. One, she lost her job when the apartment complex she managed was bought and the new owners brought in their own people. She was also diagnosed with breast cancer with involvement of the lymph nodes. The prognosis at that time was guarded because of the lymph node involvement and she was put on a series of radiation treatments and Nolvidex. The prescription costs for Nolvidex costs approximately $75 a month. Being on unemployment and having no medical insurance at the time, the cost of the surgery wiped out all of her savings and assets. Since she was unable to look for work, she lost her unemployment as well. The good news was that the physicians found her to be, in their words, exquisitely sensitive to the Novodex, and it appeared after a few months that the cancer was in remission. It was at that time that she let her doctors first know, and there were four of them, that she was unable to purchase the prescription since she didn't have a job and had no money. She had other health problems, high blood pressure, uh, emphysema, and went into a severe state of depression. At that point, her doctors qualified her for Social Security, Disability, and Medicare. The monthly amount of her disability did not cover all the expenses she was incurring. After she paid her rent, electric, phone, car insurance, and taxes, she was left with a disposable income of approximately $100 to $120 a month to cover the cost of the Novodex and food, clothing, gas for the car. Um, I have submitted a copy of a financial statement that I did for her. At the, that time, her doctors were aware of her situation and were providing her with samples of most of the other drugs that she required. Maxide, Prozac, Calend SR, and Theodore. There apparently were no samples of Novodex. Each month, she chose between food and Novodex. Sometimes she chose some other necessity and stop taking it. We would become aware of that in the family uh, after the fact. She would go off for a month if the electric bill was too high, and then she would go back on. In 1988, she suffered a recurrence of the cancer in her ribs.
She was treated with radiation and again implored by her doctors to maintain the constant use of the Novodex. Again, she let them know that she didn't have the money to pay for it. Their response to her each time was, you have to find a way. <clears throat> Finally, they suggested she talk to social service agencies, which she did. They confirmed that she was not eligible for any other kind of benefits because she received too much money from Social Security. From 1988 to 1992, she maintained this program of juggling the medical bills, living expenses, and attempting to stay on the Novodex. In September of 1992, she began having difficulty walking and complained of severe back pain. A bone scan revealed advanced cancer in her lower spine and pelvic bones. At this time, she told us that she had stopped taking the Novodex in April, meaning to go back on it in May, but had never got back on it due to an increase in her rent and her electric bills. Each doctor she saw scolded her and was very angry with her because she went off the Novodex. At this point, she didn't ask anymore, she just cried. Realizing that she had no resources to obtain any medication with this advancing cancer, I contacted the volunteer group at AARP to find out what could be done to help her. They referred me to several charities. Radiation treatments were set up for her and Megase was then prescribed, which I understand is a stronger form of Novodex. The cost of the Megase is approximately the same, about $75 a month. She was also put on duragesic patches for pain at that time in various strengths. The 50 micromilligram cost $74.50 for a 15-day supply. No one gave her that medication. They gave her a prescription. The American Cancer Society and the Virginia Food Bank both helped to buy medication for her. Between October 28th and December 1st, 1992, her children and I purchased $351 worth of drugs for her, and the various charities contributed 400 and some dollars. So total of about $830. Uh, one of those drugs near after the duragesic was no longer effective was MS Contin, which cost $300 for a bottle of 100. On December 10th, she was hospitalized and we were told that there was no more that could be done to stop the advancement of cancer. Doctors estimated that she had three to six months to live. She was moved to a skilled nursing care facility where under the Medicare provision, all expenses would be paid for 20 days. From day 21 to day 100, there would be an 8150 per day copayment, over $6,000. After day 100, all expenses would be covered. She died. 17 days later in her sleep. Her vital signs had been good and there were no complications. There is no doubt in my mind that the stress of trying to cope with the flaws in the system and trying to obtain medication contributed to her death. I've come here to ask, to, to give you the question she most often asked or responded to when we asked her why she didn't take her medicine. What am I supposed to do? if I don't have the money to pay for it. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ms. Gand. Mr. Dressing? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to publicly thank you for the leadership role that you've exhibited in all health care issues over the years. The Orphan Drug Act and uh, the, uh, the uh, constant provider and protectorate that you have been for all of the people in this country, and we appreciate your leadership. Um, I was sitting here today thinking about why we're here and listening to the testimony. I almost thought it might be appropriate if we took a break and sang the Canadian National Anthem or perhaps the Mexican National Anthem. Um, they're wonderful neighbors, and uh, we need them. But I don't want to live there. And I don't want to be dependent on either of those systems for providing what we need in this country to answer the very serious questions that we have about the future of health care. 
if we depended on either Canada or Mexico for the development of drugs to keep my son alive, we would have buried Robbie many years ago. Instead, we just married him. When Rob was diagnosed at 18 months, it was predicted that he would live to be six. And Robbie is 26. And the reason for that is that we've had the drugs that have been able to put Rob in a holding pattern until the ultimate therapies or cure for his disease can be obtained. Now I'm concerned about our zeal to look at an industry that has provided us with the kinds of tools that give hope for diseases that we had no answers for or controls that will keep people out of hospitals and allow them to return as productive members of society. Recognizing that the only way that they can provide these products for us is to be able to create profits that they can reinvest in this terribly expensive process. We have to remember that of all the drugs that get to the marketplace, only one in four or five thousand compounds makes it. And if we begin to look at an individual drug and say, it's okay to make reasonable return on this product, how do we create the environments that allow them to drill all the dry holes that they have to drill in order to bring those few that make it to the marketplace? I'm not here to defend the industry if it's gouging or if it's uh, overpricing. That would be obscene for an individual to have to make a determination of whether they pay their rent or whether they buy their drug is obscene. But it would be just as obscene if they had to make a decision about whether they were going to have an MRI, a triple bypass, or kidney dialysis. And why aren't we having hearings about those things today? Why is it the drug industry? Why do you get all the cards and letters about drugs? Why are people inflamed about the issue of drug pricing? Well, it could be that we pay 5% out of our pockets for hospital cost, but we pay 55% out of our pockets for prescriptions. When we have to reach into our pocket and pay for it, it's a bigger issue. There's probably not a person in this room who could tell us how much does an MRI cost? How much does a quadruple bypass cost? But they can tell you how much tagament costs. And the senior citizens who are writing and outraged at what they have to pay is because it's not covered by Medicare. This is an insurance problem. The issue that Mr. Aspie talked about and Ms. Gant talked about are coverage problems. We need health care insurance reform in this country. But why are we attacking the tail instead of the elephant? Drug prices represent 7%, and I think there'll be testimony today that it's even lower than that, of the total health care cost in this country. 800 or 938 billion, whatever figure you want to use, is a ton of money. And yet if we were able to go after the drug industry and reduce drug costs by 50%, we would only make a drop in the bucket difference in health care cost. It's an insurance problem. What do we do if we take away the incentives for this industry to continue to create for us the products that we so desperately need. Who's going to pick that up? They're investing at this point an equal amount to what the entire budget of the National Institutes of Health is. That's obscene, but thank God they're there. It's the only game in town. We've got to stop bashing an industry that's giving back for us the opportunity to keep people alive, the opportunity to reduce health care costs, to allow people to return to society in productive activities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dressing. Well, you raise a, a very provocative point indicating that we, we care about drug prices because we're paying for it out of pocket directly for the most part for most consumers, but for other health care costs, uh, we have insurance to pay for it. But I hear a lot of people write me as well to complain about the high cost of health insurance. 
health insurance costs, like other health care costs, are going up faster than the inflation rate in our economy to the point where the President of the United States and others have indicated we don't know if we can continue to afford those kinds of price increases. And that's without even drug coverage. But here we have drug prices going up so rapidly. And I think it's safe to say that the increase in drug prices has been much higher over the last uh, uh, four or five years than the increases in health care costs just by itself. So when we look at both of these problems, we have to ask, how can we sustain these kind of increases and what impact do we have when we have these increases that our people are asked to pay? Mr. Pollack, uh, you know, whenever we talk about drug prices, we usually hear from the drug companies about research, and Mr. Dressing made that point. The, uh, the argument is that high prices uh, are necessary to stimulate research on breakthrough drugs and no one in this room would want to diminish the research on breakthrough drugs. But that argument seems to me to be the strongest to justify high prices of drugs when they're introduced, when they've just come up with a new drug. But it's hard to see how that argument can justify the extraordinary price increases that we've seen in recent years when we look at drugs that are already on the market. Many. Uh, could you tell the subcommittee in your study whether you did any evaluation of these price increases for drugs that are already on the market so we can have some sense of whether we're getting uh, high increases for drugs that are not new ones but old ones? Yes. In the report that uh, I mentioned at the beginning, we looked at the top 20 drugs. And these drugs, uh, of all the hundreds upon hundreds of drugs on the market, consume almost 30% uh, of the market share of, of uh, uh, what is spent on prescription drugs. And we looked at what happened to those prices in the period between 1985 and 1991, after they'd come out uh, and they'd been priced presumably to take into account research and development and other costs associated with those drugs. What we found with respect to those top 20 drugs is that they rose in price even faster than general prescription drugs did. Uh, in that period, inflation rose by 21 percent. Uh, the average price of these drugs rose by 79 percent, or about four times the rate of inflation. And not only did they increase far faster than inflation, approximately four times as fast, but some of these drugs rose more than one time per year. Uh, Indoral, Zantac, Procardia, Capitin rose eight times in that period between 1985 and 1991. Lopressor rose nine times. N Naproxen rose ten times. So the point that you made is, is very appropriate. That after taking into account all these expenses and original pricing, those prices still rose far faster than inflation. I suppose the argument could be made that uh, you need those price increases on older drugs that are successful to use the money for research for uh, new drugs that may be successful, but many of which will not be successful. And therefore, you need this additional funding for the pharmaceutical industry uh, to, uh, to do the research and to hopefully make those breakthroughs. How do you respond to that? Well, I, 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 I agree partially with what Mr. Dressing said. We certainly do want to see increased uh, uh, research and development. I think Mr. Bliley asked the question very appropriately uh, earlier on. Uh, but the reality is that only a small portion of uh, the income derived by the prescription drug companies goes to research and development. Only approximately 15 percent of the income from the drug companies goes for research and development. And that, and that provides actually a fairly ge uh, generous interpretation of what is counted as research and development. I'd be much happier to see uh, some of these drug prices if we knew that a good portion of that money was being used for research and development. The reality is it's more going into advertising and promotion and for profits. Well, and let me uh, get back to the subject of this hearing today. Because of these high-priced drugs, people like uh, Mr. Aspie and his wife are going to another country, neighboring country, to buy drugs. And Mr. Aspie, you've been able to go and buy dr drugs dramatically cheaper in Mexico than what you had, had to pay in the United States. Did, you, did your doctor 
tell you the, those drugs that you would buy in Mexico would be as good as the drugs that you would buy here? They're exactly the same. Same drug? Uh, same drug. Same manufacturer? Same manufacturer, know? other than I understand that the one, her main one, Ventolin, is uh, controlled by a company in England, and they, I guess, what do they call it, lease it out to con other countries. The same drug is made in the United States, is made in Mexico City, that she uses. Well, it, it just seems to me that uh, it's not right for Americans to have to pay more money than other countries for the same drug, no matter what the justifications are, and I think the justification of research and development is uh, overused when we see the kind of money that's going elsewhere. Mr. Uh, Wexman, if I may just, I, if I may just uh, add, if we're talking about research and development uh, uh, funding sales, that has nothing to do with a differential of four times. Uh, you, when you look at the drugs uh, sold in Mexico versus the United States, there was a fourfold difference. Research and development only accounts for about 15 percent. So, yes, it accounts for some portion of the differential, but a very tiny fraction of that differential. Well, I, th I thank you very much, each of you, for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Aspie, Ms. Gant, and Mr. Dressing, I thank you very much for coming here and sharing your personal family situations uh, with us. And it, I think it's been helpful to us to, to put a person and an individual circumstance behind this abstract problem of numbers and percentages and figures. Mr. Wiley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Since I was late, I'd like to, uh, uh, permission to insert my uh, opening statement in the record. Without objection, I'm video. Uh, Mr. Pollock, the, uh, the top 20, these are the top 20 in sales? That's right, Mark. Sure, that's right. Right. The drugs. Okay. 15% uh, uh, in, in R&D. Uh, may not sound like much, but when you consider that uh, in addition to that they got to pay all of their expenses uh, and that they have to uh, presumably make some kind of return to the stockholders, uh, uh, it's, isn't it as an industry the largest uh, in, the, in the United States? I mean, is there any other industry that, that puts 15 percent into R&D? I, I, I don't, I can't tell you uh, which industries put in more and, and, and uh, uh, I will tell you, however, if you want to compare uh, the profit margins of the uh, prescription drug companies that make the top 20 drugs, you'll see a stark comparison between uh, for, uh, them and the Fortune 500 companies. Our study did look at that. And let me give you, we looked at it for each of the years from 1985 to 1991. And in each and every one of those years, the differential was three to five fold. Now, for example, in 1991, the manufacturers of the top 20 drugs made a profit of 15.1% of total sales compared to 3.2% for the median Fortune 500 company. It's almost a five fold difference. Uh, I don't have any answer for that, uh, and don't wouldn't try to try to give one. Now, these drugs are the same drugs made by the same people, and I appreciate uh, your testimony, Mr. Dressing, and, and all of that. But the people in these other countries who are sick uh, profit from the same research as the people do, as, as does your son here. Uh, why shouldn't they pay for this research and development just as our people uh, are required to pay for it? That's, that's the problem I have. I mean, uh, you know, it's the same drug, it's in the same form and, and everything else. Now, I realize that in Mexico you've got lower uh, wage wages, uh, but still somebody has to buy that product in Mexico in order for them to sell it there. And they buy it from the same manufacturer that, uh, you know, that you buy it here. 
And uh, I realize that it might pass through more hands here, but I, I would think that's probably not too, I, I would think that uh, that small town in, in Mexico that you went to, I doubt if uh, those, those people could buy themselves, individual shop owners, uh, considering they probably have less money to start with and for capital uh, in the quantities uh, that would, you know, direct from from uh, up John or or Merck or, or whomever. Uh, so they have to have distributors too, who have to get make pay their bills and and make a living. Uh, so I don't have any answer for that, and I hope that when the next panel comes in the drug industry, that uh, they will have answers for us. But I was intrigued, uh, Mr. Aspey. One point. Uh, you bought a year's supply, and I, I admire your, your foresight and your ability to take advantage of a situation. Uh, but normally when a pres doctor prescribes a prescription here, he puts a quantity on there. How do you get around that in, in, in Mexico? This is not a, a uh, medicine that she needs a prescription for. This is a prescription she's been on for over 30 years. I see. And yes. there's no, no limit? There's no limit to this, on, no. On the quantity, no. I see. Okay, mm -hmm. that was the only thing that, that yeah. stuck in my mind. How, if you got a prescription, could you buy in that, in that quantity? When you go uh, over there, if you have, if they have, they just don't sell you everything that you want. You go over there and there's some drugs, if you don't have a prescription for it, you don't get it. I mean, it's not that you can, it's all free. Uh-uh. <laughs> they are very uh, exacting on that. And their pharmacists are licensed by the, oh, yes. by the government of Mexico? I imagine so. Uh, the one we went to was very well controlled. I see. You're nodding your head, Mr. Pollock. Yes, and I, sh I should say to you, uh, Mr. Bliley, that, that uh, Mr. Ashby is not an uh, unusual person in the respect of the story that he tells us. Uh, if you go to Algodones, you will see people lined up outside in a parking lot waiting to get into the parking lot and then they just walk a little less than a hundred yards to this town that looks like a Hollywood set and its virtual only reason for existence is to beckon US consumers to come and buy prescription drugs and you've got snowbirds in the thousands going over to Algodones to buy these prescription drugs as I said Algodones really owes its very existence to the huge differential in prescription drug prices between Mexico and the United States. And that differential uh, has nothing to do with research and development, because only a very small portion of that difference is due to research and development. Mr. Chairman? Uh, may I say something? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Bliley, uh, you completed your questions. We're going to have to go on, and maybe the point you want to raise will be asked in a question, but uh, the members really have the time now to pursue questions. Mr. Wyden. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Aspey, we're always glad uh, when witnesses come from the Northwest, and we're glad you're, uh, glad you're here. You mentioned uh, you have an income of around six, $1,600 a month, the Social Security and a little pension and the like. You know, we know that for seniors, the big out-of-pocket cost now very often is prescription medicine. I'm curious, this year, you know, you got the 3% increase in Social Security and some of these other ones, I assume, went up a little bit. Did you find that your prescription drug bill uh, more than ate up any increase that you would have had in Social Security and retirement? I think so, but um, as an example, now... My wife sent down to her daughter-in-law in El Centro to get her some more medicine. The, the year's supply was just about used up. She went over to get the same medicine that I bought last year. We compared the prices here before I came to this uh, meeting. The Venelin in Emmett cost about $60 today. It was 52 and change last year. It went up to $11 and change I don't know exactly what the change was in Mexico for the same medicine that I bought a year ago. Yeah. Well, it's very helpful. And what I'm, I'm seeing with seniors at, at home is that what they're getting by way of an increase in Social Security in their retirement is eaten up just by drug price increases alone. 
not anything else they would spend on health care like long-term care. And it's an extraordinary indictment, I think, that you have made of uh, the way we're doing business today. And I think you've illustrated very well why the health care marketplace, uh, such as it is, isn't working uh, for seniors. Now, one question for you, uh, Mr. Pollack, uh, on this R&D argument, I think, and I've tried to compute up all the incentives that I have voted for over the years for the drug industry, from product liability reform, which I've supported, to capital gains incentives, to R&D credits and, and the like. The, the list goes on and on. And what I find the companies still do is really try to hold the patients politically hostage. They, in effect, say, unless we can charge what we want, we won't see this R&D, which will get us a cure for Alzheimer's and the like. My question to you is, does it have to be one or the other? Does it have to only be adequate research and incentives for the business or fair pricing? I mean, it seems to me we can have a measure of both. I'm certainly trying to vote for a measure of both, and that's why I mentioned some of those incentives, which I think are very generous for the industry. But I'm curious, since uh, you all have looked at this, can't we have some of both, some incentives for research and development, and at the same time try to prevent these, uh, these tragedies where people like Mr. Asby have to get in there? Uh, mobile home or their car or something and traipse all over the United States trying to and other countries to pay for medicine? I, I think everyone in this room, certainly every one of us in the panel and I'm sure all of you on the subcommittee feel that uh, there's been a very vital contribution to the health care of Americans uh, by the innovative uh, work of the prescription drug companies. We don't want to bring that to an end. But uh, it's one thing to say that we want that innovation uh, and to say that, uh, therefore, we can't put any kind of an end to price gouging that is taking place. I think we can achieve both things. I think we can establish policies that allow the drug companies to continue being as innovative as they have been while at the same time uh, uh, restricting what I think are skyrocketing costs, which are making uh, prescription drug costs more and more unaffordable for too many Americans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Warden, you have another minute. If you yield to me, I want to ask Mr. Pollack a question so we'll have a second round. But we heard a, an explanation from GAO why they thought the prices for drugs were cheaper in Canada. They had a board that set the prices. They had a formulary. What's your explanation for the lower prices in Mexico as compared to the prices in the United States? I, I'm not sure I can answer that. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe that Mexico has the same kind of regulatory systems as uh, uh, we experience in, uh, in, in the European countries uh, or in Canada. I believe that, uh, and I believe that uh, it is pretty much uh, what the market will bear in, in Mexico. I don't believe they have such a regulatory system. So I can't give you an explanation other than it just happens to be considerably cheaper. I don't believe it's a product of a regulatory system. Is it the fact that it just is so, is so cheap to produce the pills themselves that they look at the market in Mexico, they know they're not going to get the same price they get in I believe, that, I believe that States? is true, uh, and it's certainly, uh, um, uh, I, I, let, me, let me leave it there, I believe that is correct. Yeah. Well, it's a question maybe we can get further answer on. Uh, Mr. Upton. Thank you. I, I really have probably just one question for Mr. Dressing, uh, and I appreciate your, your hard work and, and leadership in the cystic fibrosis cause. I've, I've been... I've tried to be helpful in a number of benefits uh, myself, and I'm truly excited about the breakthrough that uh, really was announced, I guess it was last year, and, and, uh, and uh, the cure that we're, we're hoping will be permanent. But what do you think would have happened with the research on this if we had uh, had a similar system as Canada has with regard to price controls and, and regulation? What if, what if that, those same things were imposed here in, in the U.S. and uh, relating both to your personal experience with your son as well as to your leadership of the foundation. Uh, where do you think we'd be here in 1993 if we had the same 
type of plan imposes what Canada has today. Earlier reference was made to proof is in the pudding. I think a uh, perfect example is the fact that the United States is the leader. These products are coming out of the United States. It's not the rest of the world. It's not Canada. It's not Mexico that's producing these breakthrough drugs and giving us the opportunities that we have with children like my own son today. And I think that uh, it is clearly the environment that we have been able to create in this country for the provision of the stimulation of this industry that has allowed us to become the world leader. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, there's a lot of reference to the fact that the drug industry has, uh, has had successes and their profits that uh, uh, eclipse uh, the balance of the, you know, the Fortune 500. If there were a trial for the Fortune 500 CEOs to stand up and explain the, how well they've run their businesses in the last five years, there would be a lot of them that would go to jail. So I don't think we should use that as an example. They haven't done a good job, and a lot of them are losing their jobs. This industry is, is a leader. They've taken advantage of, of opportunities to create for us those things that we desperately need in the healthcare industry. And I think they're to be applauded, not bashed for that. Thank you. Mr. Washington. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dressing. Did you have an opportunity to, to, you were trying to interject something a while back, did you get a chance to express that thought? Uh, thank you, I didn't, and it was reference to, uh, we pay more in this country for the very same product that someone could go to Canada or Mexico and buy. And, and one of the things that we've accepted in this country is the fact that we do provide subsidies. We take care of the world for defense. Japan and Europe and, and the balance of this world that is so desperately dependent upon the United States to provide the protection, protection knows they're going to get it. Well, we pay for that because we believe it is in the interest of the United States to provide for that protection. We may be, you know, it's just possible, we may be subsidizing the drug industry in the world by the, by the, in, by the mentality that we have that stimulates investment and the creation of innovation. We may be paying for that, but I can tell you as a recipient of the benefits that we would get, that we do get, as a result of living in this environment, I'll take it because I don't know where the other games are. I don't know where it's going to be supplied if we are successful in getting drug prices in the United States regulated down to the price that they are in Canada and Mexico. I'll bet we can do that. I don't think there's any question we can do that. But in five or ten years, as we sit back and look at the pipeline and wonder what happened to the innovation, what happened to the creation of those products that have now provided for our health care to soar out of control because we don't have that investment, are we going to really think that maybe we shot ourselves in the foot? And all I'm asking for is caution that we be very responsible as we look at issues of how we're going to regulate and get prices down. And I want prices to be lower, and my son wants prices to be lower. He's almost without insurance because he's, he's uh, not, he's pre-existing condition. So he's got an insurance problem. And that insurance problem is going to mean he's going to pay for all these things, or we're going to pay for all these things. That's a problem. I want low prices, but please, at the expense of trying to control something that everybody is saying, this one sticks out because I have to reach into my pocket to pay for it. We don't shoot ourselves in the foot and kill the goose that laid the golden egg. I'm not defending the industry. I don't own any stock in any large pharmaceutical company, but I can tell you I put stock in them and I depend on them and my son depends on them and all the people at this panel depend on them and we have to be careful. Just be careful that what we do is going to give us the solutions we want, not at the expense of what we have created in this country as the world's best system. It's the world's best system of health care. My colleagues at Buffalo General can't hardly handle the people that are coming over from Canada to access the world's best system. Now, we can't pay for it all, and we don't have access for it all, and we don't have coverage for it all, but let's not destroy it in, at, the, at the attempt of answering a problem that I believe is insurance. Mr. Washington, would you yield to me? I'll be happy to yield, to the Chairman. The problem with what I have with what you're saying, Mr. Dressing, is it cannot be considered the world's best system 
when you tell us your son can't get health insurance because he has a pre-existing condition. It cannot be considered the world's best system when Ms. Gant has to tell us a story about a woman who is a friend of hers who dies because she cannot afford to buy a drug that will treat uh, breast cancer. It cannot be the world's best system when the pharmaceutical companies make more profit than any other industry known in this nation and they won't schedule their prices so that American people can buy their products. Something is wrong. And I very much appreciate what you're saying out of a great deal of sincerity that we must not destroy the research capability of the American pharmaceutical industry. We do place a high priority on that. The American taxpayers pay for research through NIH and all over this nation which the pharmaceutical companies take advantage of appropriately for new breakthroughs, and then they make the profits out of it. But we cannot have the American people be priced out of the, those drugs that are now going to be available to Canadians and Europeans and Mexicans and everyone else. Uh, that's, uh, it seems to me, the balance that we have to achieve. Without objection, gentlemen from Texas will be given uh, three additional minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, let me follow up. I, I'm, I'm still with you, Mr. Dressing. Uh, going back to my friend from, from Michigan, I think, got close to the, Mr. Upton on the other end. <clears throat> he raised, I think, he touched upon a philosophical question. You may have already answered it with your rather, frankly, radical statement about subsidy, but let's just follow up on that for a moment. It, it was provocative, at least. <laughs> You're troubled by the fact, I, I trust that you're troubled by the fact, if it's true, that the American consumer pays more for the same product than does the rest of the world. I hope you are. Um, I, I'm troubled by the fact that we have in this country um, uh, regulations and a litigious mentality and um, a lot of factors that uh, we have to address that may not exist in other environments that so somehow have to be yes. covered. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Okay. I, I, don't, I only have three minutes. And I'm, I'm not trying to be abrupt with you, but I'm, I'm trying to get to a point that I want to get you to answer. If, if it is, in fact, a subsidy, Oughtn't it best be regulated and controlled through the government rather than on a willy-nilly basis of being an involuntary subsidy by consumers? Well, I, and I don't want to offend, but I'm worried about regulation and our ability to manage because I, I look at programs that we have put in in the government where we have attempted to do that and they don't work very well. Regulated industries don't do very well. Regulated uh, uh, policies, uh, we don't, they don't work very well. Medicare Granted. and Medicaid Granted. don't work. Granted. But, but unregulated pricing of a consumer where the gentleman has from Idaho has to drive to Mexico doesn't work very well either, does it? No, he, it doesn't. He's subsidizing against his will. You may be able and willing to subsidize. There are a lot of other people who are not. And that's the problem, it seems to me. Now, now, let's get back to the goose that laid the golden egg. And, and I agree with you. That we all want to ensure that, that whatever happens, and I don't mean just we up here, I mean we out there, the real we, want to ensure that we don't kill the goose that laid the golden egg. But at the same time, we want to make sure that whatever is for research and development is for research, research and development. And, and and by the same token, we want them to make a fair return on their investment. But does that justify paying twice as much in the United States as it does in Canada? Well, I think there's going to be a lot of testimony on the GAO report and the pricing uh, differences. And I really would uh, yield that to those people who are going to defend that. I've, I think my position is one, I'm a dad who's trying to keep his kid alive with the products that the industry is providing, sure. that without which he wouldn't be. And, and my time is up. Let me say that I'm a dad, and I certainly understand where you're coming from. Whatever it costs, whatever it costs, you're willing to pay, as would anybody in similarly situated feel the same way about it. But 
if you could be objective and put that aside, I certainly, you would like to pay less, as you said at the, earlier, right? Absolutely. But at the same time, keep the quality, keep the, the research and development, and keep the industry thriving and growing. That's the magic. And make a reasonable profit, but no more. I would be happy with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Washington. Mr. Greenwood? Well, I thank uh, each of you for your testimony today. This has been a very helpful panel, and I thank you very much for coming to be with us. Our uh, next witness is Dr. Albert Wertheimer, Dean of the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science. Dr. Wertheimer will describe some of the mechanisms used in other countries to control prescription drug prices. Dr. Wertheimer, we want to welcome you to our subcommittee hearing today. Your testimony will be part of the record in its entirety. We'd like you to uh, limit your oral presentation, as I gather, to around uh, 10 minutes in order to get through all of the material that you have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Albert Wertheimer, Dean of the School of Pharmacy and Associate Vice President for International Affairs of the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science and a Vice President of the International Pharmaceutical Federation, uh, an organization of uh, pharmacists of uh, over 60 nations. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for this opportunity to share with you today information concerning the methods by which other countries control drug prices. The reality is that the same drug in the same dosage form and strength manufactured by the same company can be purchased in Australia for as little as 20% of its selling price in the United States. Despite efforts to close the gap in prices within the European community, pharmaceutical prices vary greatly among member states. In fact, in the end of 1991, when prices were uh, studied in the EC, uh, compared to an index of 100, they ranged from an index value of 57.7 in Portugal to 143.4 in Denmark. The organization and financing of pharmaceutical services, as well as all aspects of drug delivery in different countries, are products of the history, of the traditions, the political and economic systems, the geography, and the wealth of a nation. For example, it seems only reasonable to expect that different pathologies, and therefore different drugs, would be used more or less frequently in different nations. For example, in the island nations in the tropics and south, in the South Pacific, we might see different diseases and different drugs than would be used in Alaska. Specific characteristics of any pharmacy program must be compatible with features of the overall healthcare delivery system of that nation. The flying doctors of Australia, the barefoot doctors in the People's Republic of China, and other interesting features we can find around the world in a medical travel log are in place because of the balance of needs, resources, and the consideration of alternatives. It's true that many nations are able to lower pharmaceutical prices to levels well below those of the United States, and whether this can be considered successful depends on the interpretation of the, world, of the word success. Is it successful if the, lower, if the wholesale prices of drugs are lower in other countries? In some places, the answer to that is yes. Is it important that the nation be the parent of many uh, new pharmaceutical innovations? Another question that can only be answered by the persons establishing uh, means to lower drug prices. It would be reasonable to say that the United States represents the model with the greatest laissez-faire policies of developed Western nations regarding the pharmaceutical industry. The Medicaid rebates are perhaps the major involvement in our federal government in controlling pharmaceutical pricing in the United States. Granted, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the military, and other large buyers have received favorable drug prices for many years, but this is similar to any large buyer being able to take advantage of economies of scale and the benefits available to large purchasers, whether they be hospitals, 
pharmacy chain stores, etc. Permit me to explain the mechanisms by which some other nations regulate and control their pharmaceutical prices. I've chosen first to explore a little bit about the United Kingdom, a nation similar to us in society and history and culture, <coughs> lifestyle, wealth. In the UK, the Department of Health publishes something called the drug tariff, and it's the price of pharmaceuticals uh, for the coming period of time. There's very little deals, uh, special free goods, um, other types of discounts, but the pharmaceutical industry, the wholesalers, the pharmacists, and the physicians all know from the prices in this book what the prices will be. The vast majority of the population of the United Kingdom is eligible for the National Health Insurance, or the National Health Service, rather, program. There is a co-payment that is required of uh, individuals, with the exception of children less than one year of age, persons suffering from a large list of chronic diseases, old age, pensioners, etc. The plan here is so that the individual patient will not have as one of their barriers a financial constraint when buying pharmaceuticals. And in fact, it's estimated that more than half of the population of the UK does not pay the copay because of their eligibility through one of these plans. The UK also has something called the limited list. There's a list of categories of products where the generic pharmaceutical must be used and if there's to be any other product used, the reimbursement is only for the generic. This is with the case with a number of products that have been on the market for a long time where there can be little argument that the research and development have been paid for and uh, products that are very common and have large sales volumes. The payment to the pharmacist is made by the government and there are limits. There is annual negotiations for the uh, reimbursement for the professional dispensing function which is added to the wholesale price, to the price of the drug uh, which is printed in the tariff. There are a number of transparency regulations and information are sent, is sent to doctors uh, who are expected to consider the price of pharmaceuticals. This information is in uh, printed form uh, through newsletters, uh, prescribers, journals, and other materials that emanate from the Department of Health and from the regional health authorities. Perhaps the most powerful force at uh, containing the cost of pharmaceuticals in the UK is something called the Pharmaceutical Price Regulatory Scheme. It allows a specified return on capital invested in research and development. Uh, at the moment, this is somewhere around 17 percent. And as a matter of fact, much of the thinking behind this was in the same vein as what I've been hearing uh, with this um, hearing earlier, and that is to attempt to lower prices without uh, killing the goose that lays the golden eggs and permitting the pharmaceutical industry to have rewards for innovation. A company negotiates with the Department of Health and in essence the company is free to set the price of a product where it sees fit. But there are uh, rules regarding the overall profitability of a pharmaceutical company. There is a large amount of information and data that the company must supply to the Department of Health uh, regarding expected sales and this multiplied times the selling price uh, determines a ceiling. If the company exceeds this level there's something called the clawback in which monies then either have to be paid back to the Department of Health for these what they would call excess profits or the money has to be diverted into research and development or the company can lower prices. One of the most interesting features about this UK plan is that the company has the right to lower prices where it may choose to. So it has this flexibility, not necessarily with some products that uh, would be blockbusters, but that means that they have to realign prices throughout the line in order to be compliant with the uh, profit regulatory scheme. Transfer pricing 
and some of the other schemes that are, that are used um, elsewhere to maintain high prices are strictly controlled. And in fact, the cost of uh, promotional activities is limited to 10% of the selling price uh, in the calculation of the costs of doing business for a product. That doesn't mean the company cannot uh, devote more than 10% of its selling price to uh, promotional and advertising expenses, but they can only claim 10% in these calculations. And the most recent nuance in the United Kingdom uh, for them to further lower uh, pharmaceutical prices have been the creation of uh, local budgets with the general practitioner committees. And these are local committees made up of general practitioners and they're given specific budgets for different uh, services. And for their pharmaceutical budget, they generally get together, uh, meet with the other GPs, with pharmacists, and um, other experts where needed, and determine what would be the equivalent of local formularies. In some cases, these may be agreements to exclude certain very high-priced products, and in other cases, uh, to use uh, certain products. I might mention, lastly, um, that the system appears to be working, even though there's some uh, complaints about it. It's been in effect for more than 20 years now. And some of the British companies, Glaxo, SmithKline, Beecham, Imperial Chemical Industries, Boots, and Fisons, are amongst the most prolific in the world with reference to uh, new products. Let me go on, if I might, uh, Mr. Chairman, and discuss some of the situation in Germany. Germany uh, provides health care to its population through a large number of sickness funds. These might be organized by uh, labor union-related organizations, local uh, organizations, um, and, in a, and any number of other groups. They're regulated as to the standards that they must comply with uh, by the national government, and therefore, uh, all of these programs include uh, prescribed drugs. The Germans use something called the fixed rate support scheme in which their experts in pharmacology, medicine, and pharmacy determine what's the least expensive comparable product in a therapeutic category. That drug is available for free to the patients and if the patient wants or the physician prescribes anything in that category at a higher cost, then the patient has to pay the difference. The comparison price charts include drugs in three categories. The first are identical active ingredients. The second is uh, pharmaceutical or therapeutic uh, comparable ingredients. And the third category here is where the uh, pharmacological or therapeutic um, effect is the same as the, the base um, rate support scheme product. They have a negative list in Germany of products that are not included for reimbursement. These include oral contraceptives, vitamins, cough and cold preparations, and uh, drugs for a number of um, what are more commonly called trivial diseases. But there are 2,500 drugs in this negative list, and it does include a number of products that are expensive, extremely expensive, or where there's, the product is still on the market but might be considered obsolete because better and uh, newer drugs have become available. Dr. Wertheimer, I'm going to interrupt you to start my questioning, and your full written statement will be part of the record. But what is, this, what is the idea of a negative list? Why would they have a negative list in Germany? Just to finish to get to that point. Well, the, the, the negative list makes it very clear that uh, certain drugs cannot or will not be reimbursed. And um, when one establishes a formulary, um, it's probably more common in this country to establish a, po a positive formulary, as, as the Medicaid programs had done in the past, um, and say, we will pay for these drugs. And the physician then looks up to see if his or her drug is in there, and if not, chooses something else. The, the negative list is generally shorter, um, easier to read, easier to carry around, and uh, permits uh, at a glance to find out whether a drug is explicitly excluded. Well, it, it's interesting to know that other countries have tried different mechanisms to try to deal with the, the, the problem that we're facing today. We want to get a better buy for our consumers, lower prices, so that the people can afford these uh, drugs. On the other hand, we want uh, innovation. I, I was fascinated by your report of what's being done in the United Kingdom 
Because there, it seems to me, they have a system where they they limit the amount that can be spent on advertising and promotion, and they limit the profits that can be made by the pharmaceutical company. And the consequence of that is that the companies are taking more money and putting it into research, right. which doesn't come off their profit uh, margin. Is that, is that an accurate statement? That's, that's correct. And in fact, that uh, program is a voluntary scheme uh, that was worked out many years ago between their equivalent of our PMA, the, the ABPI, and the manufacturer, uh, and the government. Well, you know, the President of the United States uh, recently indicated that uh, um, in this country we sp spend substantially more money on promotion than on research. Now, the promotion is not just advertisements in uh, television or newspapers, but often it's uh, uh, special symposia for doctors or uh, ways to try to influence these doctors by taking them on free trips or uh, or even sometimes consulting payments to these physicians. Would all those kinds of things be limited as well in uh, the UK system? I think it's... Um I, I haven't seen any information that's been printed that I could cite on this, but it's my observation, and I, th I think that probably many or most would agree, that since you're only going to get credit for the 10%, that you'll cut out some of the um, uh, lower priority or uh, lower uh, uh, result uh, activities, which would probably include some of those, ac those uh, trips, etc. Well, I think this whole uh, English system is one for us to look at very carefully. Because when we're told that if we do anything to lower drug prices, we're going to hurt research, they have a system that produces more investment in research and lower prices for their consumers. I'm not saying it would apply here or work well here, but it's something that at least puts a, a lie to the argument that we have to have one or the other, either research leading to new innovations or lower prices for consumers. In this country, we try to achieve that balance by the law that we adopted in 1984 that said that we'll give pat patent protection to pharmaceuticals in order to, to give incentives for innovation through research and development, and then competition for prices at the end of the patent period when generics can come in and compete. But that hasn't really worked to accomplish the goals that we set out. Have you had any chance to evaluate what the impact has been of that law on prices in this country? Well, you, you, you um, are probably aware of this more so than I am, that the, uh, the branded prices generally increase uh, at, the, at the expiration of the patent, and um, this is generally thought to be the uh, result of the fact that there are multiple markets in the United States, that uh, the large buying groups for hospitals and HMOs can choose the generic, but um, um, an individual buying uh, out of pocket uh, may receive the branded product, and uh, generally the company sees fit to try to maximize its, um, its return by raising the price since it's going to be selling fewer units after the patent has expired. Well, your, your point was that this country has the this single laissez-faire market where we let the pharmaceutical companies seek to maximize their profits and we do very little except around the edges mm -hmm. to try to constrain that. We do a little bit for, for the Medicaid program only recently right. uh, where, and we've, uh, so we've tried to lower the prices there. We've had group buyers get together in the private sector to see if they can get a better buy and sometimes they do get a better buy a, a little a discount on the drugs that they purchase. But if we accepted the argument that one of our previous witnesses made that we must do everything to produce innovation, we'd probably pass a law saying there shouldn't be generic uh, equivalents because that will lead to lower prices. And in fact, in 1984, when we argued for the generic uh, competition, the pharmaceutical manufacturers, some anyway, not as an industry, I don't want to generalize, but some individuals came in who worked in the manufacturing of pharmaceuticals where they were under patent, and they said, even when our patent expires, we shouldn't have competition because we, the more money we make, the more money we can put into research. So I guess you, we really have to balance these things out, and the idea that r innovation and research can only be achieved by 
a concentration of greater wealth in the pharmaceutical industry's hands with government subsidizing it as a result uh, is something that can't be sustained if the consequence of that is to drive, drive people, uh, price people out of pharmaceuticals that they desperately need. So the problem is uh, very much with us. Uh, Mr. Uh, Greenwood, do you want to ask questions at this point? No. Uh, Mr. McMillan, you want to ask your questions? Um, I, have, I have a few. Okay. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Wertham, uh, there are many uh, differences in the health care systems between countries, as you pointed out. Um, I'm curious about uh, a country like France and what impact this may have upon U.S. pharmaceutical prices. I understand that France, for example, regulates their drug industry with an agency of less than 100 people, whereas the FDA in the United States has 9,000 people. Now, I realize that 9,000 are a public expense, but for every 9,000 government regulators, how many private sector um, respondents to that regulation do we have to absorb in our cost structure? I mean, have you taken a look at this by country by country and drawn any conclusion? That, that's a good question, Mr. McMillan. Um, France uh, is on record of um, planning to have something similar to the U.S. FDA in place uh, later this year. They, they've recognized that the, the system of uh, approving drugs in, in France is uh, not an adequate one. I suspect they won't have 9,000 people the first year, but um, they're definitely going in the same direction as, as the U.S. And that will, wouldn't you say, probably impose a cost on their um, industry that perhaps does not exist currently? I, I'd have to speculate, and I suspect that there might be some small uh, increase in the cost of doing business in France in, in the future, but um, I suspect it, it won't have any great role, perhaps increase prices 1%, maybe even 2% uh, uh, over what they are today. That's just a guess. I happen to be a, a true believer in, in the notion that <clears throat> a lot of our regulatory efforts uh, uh, cause a, an enormous cost uh, burden on our country, which isn't to say that we shouldn't in some cases do them. Another area would be the whole issue of um, liability. What, what are France's product liability laws with respect to pharmaceuticals that may be different from ours? Well, or Fran Canada, for that matter. Well, France uh, is a good example here. They subscribe to the, um, the, the liability laws that are being developed and have been developed for the European community and they're not so dissimilar to ours. The, the, perhaps the greatest difference, and you're, you're quite correct in pointing this out, is that there are far, far fewer product liability suits that are filed. Um, it's a much less litigious uh, country or society. Well, and the awards are lower, too. I think that, you know, is, is more widely understood, I think, with respect to the practice of medicine as opposed to pharmaceutical. Um, but didn't, um, didn't we change... Uh, the nature of that in this country so that we basically are have, have gone to a pooling but it doesn't necessarily eliminate the cost do you have an estimate of what the cost of uh, a potential liability in this country may constitute with respect to different uh, products I'm sorry sir I don't do you think it would be worth making an inquiry I, I think it would be interesting information you don't think it's a major cause of uh, Oh no! I think I think the cost of um, insurance premiums and the in the reserves for firms that self-insure are are significant. But I have no idea what what that amount is. This is hearsay, but I had heard, for example, that the liability cost of uh, a vaccine like salt may be oh in excess of fifty percent of the cost of the product. I wouldn't doubt that for vaccines. I suspect it's considerably less for uh, most uh, synthesized chemical pharmaceuticals, though. Yeah. But as I say, I don't have data. But, but you know, if we are if we are getting upset over uh, over a cost differential, which is arguable between the United States and Canada, on a magnitude of 12 percent, or maybe it's 30 percent in some cases, and then we totally ignore the fact that that the liability cost in some of our own product may be as high as 50 percent in the case of a vaccine, it seems to me we're not looking at the entire spectrum of uh, of things that impact costs in this country in contrast to others. Well, I, th I think the answer to that is that, that I would agree the, the 
the liability costs involved with vaccines are very high and it, it may well be 50%. I can't imagine it being anything close to that for the, the vast other majorities of products. Do you think it would, is there a pattern in other countries, if you go to a system of regulated price, a semi-regulated price, that also doing something that takes the liability away from the marketplace and, and assumes it for um, the regulator might be in order? Well, uh, the answer to that question really depends on the extent by which one wanted to do anything about uh, an intervention in the functioning of the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, there are, there are countries where the government owns pharmaceutical plants and produces generic drugs for, for local distribution, and then they would have to assume uh, responsibility. But um, I would think that if uh, something were tried similar to what's been done in similar nations such as France or England or Germany, that the um, liability issue wouldn't be any greater than it is today, and perhaps less. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Camillo. And, uh, Mr. Wyden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, doctor, let me ask you on this matter of, uh, of research. Uh, we all know that a number of countries have very little research capability. We've been talking about how the British seem to have significant research capability. And my understanding is that in Britain, about 14% of, uh, of the dollars are allocated to research, and it's about 16% in the United States. Is that your understanding? Those are the numbers that I hear as well, uh, Mr. Wyden. Now, the British system also puts limits on advertising. Yes. So is it possible that one of the reasons that the British, unlike a lot of the other uh, foreign countries, do have a per si pretty significant level of research, is that they have put some of these limitations on marketing and advertising and public relations that uh, Chairman Waxman and I have been talking about? That's probably 100 percent correct. Um, there are a number of uh, countries uh, that when a British company wants to license its product in Sweden or wherever um, will ask what is your price in your home country and they won't accept it at a lower rather than lowering the price at home it's better for them to put the money into R&D or some other uh, legitimate expenditure. Well, I, I think this is a very important case and as the chairman said we're going to explore it uh, more carefully because here is a concrete example of how where if you do uh, put some limits on the extras and I've talked about a number of drugs that essentially sell themselves. Taxol has been one example we've seen uh, recently. You can in fact get your research level up so that patients and others can know that uh, we're going forward in this country uh, with innovation. The only other question I had uh, for you, Dr. Wertheimer, we have been talking, the GAO report has not dealt with it, but we've been talking about prices in Mexico as well today. Do you have any information about how drug prices are regulated there and, and why uh, we might be seeing this phenomenon of people from Pacific Northwest uh, traipsing all over the countryside to other countries trying to get these drugs? Well, Mexico does have controls over prices. The, the prices are established um, uh, through the um, Social Security system. There are three health care systems in Mexico. There's uh, a private sector, and there's a section for people who receive insurance by virtue of their employment and government employees, and then there's a welfare system. And, um, and prices are different in all three, but uh, in, in two of the three, there's... Uh, quite a large extent of uh, regulation regarding prices and price increases have to be approved. Um, and the public sector is, is the least regulated of those, but it indeed is regulated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wyden. Mr. Greenwood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's been a lot of discussion about not wanting to, to uh, kill the goose that lays the golden egg, and, the, and that referring to the ability of the industry to innovate. The other, there are other gooses that lay golden eggs that at least some of us want to preserve, and one of them is our free market nature of our economy. Um, and another might be uh, our free speech tradition that might be limited by uh, um, prohibitions against advertising. My question for you is, uh, do you have recommendations? You talked about the fact that we are laissez-faire, uh, have a laissez-faire approach uh, to this industry. You also, in your, in your in your testimony, a written testimony, talked about the, the, the tightrope-like nature of regulating um, this industry so that you go too far and you, and you kill innovation. You don't go far enough, you have escalation in prices. 
do you have recommendations that would make that would that would uh, secure our free market traditions and our, our our free speech traditions and make this this industry more competitive and 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 use the best of those traditions i.e. free market competitive nature of our economy to make uh, 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 to have a, a downward effect on pricing. Well, I, I, I'm in agreement 100% that the, the industry is valuable to us um, for the economy. It's uh, valuable for earning um, uh, foreign exchange, uh, trade balance. Um, but I do think that if any intervention were applied across the board, then, it, then it's operating on a level playing field and it does not diminish then from the competitive forces at work. I think that if one were to look, almost any really good drug receives a very nice um, uh, total sales uh, and uh, market share. Um, and so if the focus were placed on uh, research productivity, some controls over um, prices and uh, promotional activities as the British do, I, th I think that it might uh, clean some things up and reduce prices a bit. I, I think the British system is probably the, the one that has come the closest to, to walking, balancing on that tightrope or high wire, that um, pr it has effectively lowered prices and um, the British pharmaceutical industry is extremely prolific with uh, new products. So it doesn't appear that, um, that it has harmed the, uh, the viability of the industry. In all due respect, I'm not sure that that was really responsive. My my, my question is not I mean, what your answer implied was that you could you could um, impose some some federal mandates on the industry, uh, limiting its prices, uh, limiting its 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 um, promotional activities, and the companies could still compete. My question is really geared in a different way, and that is, are there ways that we can uh, engender greater competition? Among the among the pharmaceutical manufacturers, and have that greater competition decrease the consumer price, rather than than going in the direction of, of of further regulation. In other words, is our is our, for instance, our patenting system and our generic system sufficiently uh, conducive to competition, or are we are is part of our problem maybe here that we are over regulating already, and that's what's and that's what's having the the upward effect on prices. Well, if I might, the, uh, I think one of the most direct answers to your question would be the fact that uh, one has to look at the nature of the industry, and that is that the people who are selecting the products generally are not the ones paying for them, and that, that in and of itself uh, is, a, is, a, is a source of problems, because if the physician who orders the prob uh, product doesn't pay for it, th then there's little incentive unless they're in a program uh, where there's some... Um, restraints, uh, controls, or incentives or disincentives for using expensive products. We, we see most of what I'm hinting at uh, in a number of HMOs in this country and in managed care organizations. Um, and then the, the Germans have recently, for example, uh, penalized physicians who uh, have, um, whose cost of prescribing has uh, accelerated beyond uh, some agreed upon, I think it's a 6.6% inc increase per year. I, I hope I'm answering the question, but um, it's difficult because of the nature of all of the characteristics and the traditions to, to change everything. And, and perhaps being more competitive uh, may not be the answer. More competitive means perfect information, and that's difficult for consumers to, to use. Um, not that it sh perhaps shouldn't be tried. It's a complex situation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Washington, questions? Mr. Steiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Wertheimer, in response to the question on why drugs uh, in Mexico and Canada are half to a third the cost of what they are in the United States, uh, you alluded to the fact that they are regulated uh, in those countries. Uh, are the drug companies losing money in Canada and uh, Mexico, or are they making money there also? Well, I don't know, and I'm sure they wouldn't. Uh, I'm not sure they would tell me if uh, if, if they were. This this kind of information probably isn't um, shared with uh, people at, uh, outside the industry. I, I think it's a reasonable guess, uh, and, I, and I'm not being flippant, sir. But I, I think that it um, 
if the company wasn't at least uh, making some return, they wouldn't be doing business in those countries. And in fact, uh, the prices in many countries around the world are considerably lower than the, the Mexican and the Canadian prices, and uh, U.S. pharmaceutical firms are found in, uh, directly or through agents in virtually all of those nations. And they are not as necessarily as regulated as Canada and Mexico. Uh, many are more, more regulated. Many more are regulated. much more regulated. But it is safe to assume that they are making money in those countries or they wouldn't be selling drugs there. Well, logic would dictate that, but uh, I don't have a specific answer. Thank you, Dr. Um, thank you, Mr. Seinar. Uh, Dr. Wertheimer, thank you very much for your testimony. You've given us uh, a lot to think about as we evaluate how other countries have handled this problem. And we appreciate your uh, being with us today. Thank you very much. Our final panel consists of the following people, and I'd like to call them forward. Gerald Mossinghoff, who will testify on behalf of the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. Richard Lane, who will testify on behalf of Merck and Company. Robert Namath, who will testify on behalf of Pfizer, Inc. Leia Smith, who will testify on behalf of the Upjohn Company. Professor Ernst Berndt of the MIT School of Management. And Dr. S Stephen Sch Schondelmeyer, of the University of Minnesota College of uh, Pharmacy. Pleased to welcome you to our hearing today. Your prepared statements will be on the record in full. What we'd like to ask each of you is to limit the oral presentation to no more than five minutes so we can have uh, an opportunity to hear from everybody. Uh, Mr. Mossinghoff, why don't we start with you, button on the base of the mic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, let me briefly make five points. In the last 12 months, there have been profound changes in the patent protection for pharmaceuticals around the world, and particularly in North America. Following a lead taken by the United States in the Waxman Hatch Act of 1984 and by Japan in 1987, the European community has moved to effectively extend patent protection for pharmaceuticals to 15 years. The People's Republic of China is now providing for the first time full protection for pharmaceuticals. Here in North America, Mexico has now adopted a new patent law fully protecting pharmaceuticals, and just two weeks ago, Canada finally totally reversed its ill-advised limitations on patent protection for drugs by deciding to provide patent protection for pharmaceuticals comparable to that provided in most all, all, all other industrialized countries. Secondly, the United States pharmaceutical industry, as a result of its enormous long-term investment in research and development, is a prototype of an innovative and inter internationally competitive, successful American industry. The pharmaceutical industry created 80,000 jobs in the United States during the past decade, while the manufacturing sector as a whole lost more than one million jobs. It is one of the few high technology industries in this country that has consistently maintained a positive balance of trade. The U.S. Commerce Department estimates a 1.3 billion positive balance of trade for 1992 and projects the same for this year. Third, to maintain its position as a world leader in pharmaceutical innovation, the U.S. industry continues to significantly increase its investment in research and development, even as overall R&D investment has slowed in the U.S. and other industries have cut back on these expenditures. The pharmaceutical industry has doubled its investment in R&D every five years since 1970, and as shown in the figure, will invest an estimated $12.6 billion this year, an increase of 13.5%. Drug prices have slowed dramatically in the recent past. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, manufacturers' price increases for prescription drugs for the 12-month period ending in January 1993 were the smallest in the past 15 years. As shown by the figure 
in my statement, the producer price index for drugs, which measures manufacturer prices, have steadily declined since 1989, dropping from 9.5 percent that year to just 5.1 percent during the past 12 months. Finally, the industry supports health care coverage for all Americans with appropriate access to quality pharmaceutical care. We believe that outpatient drugs must be included in any standard managed competition plan under proposals for health care reform, such as the ones offered by the Jackson Hole Group and the Conservative Democratic Forum. Appropriate managed care strategies provide an opportunity for maintaining quality of care while relying on market forces to restrain cost increases. With respect to the details of the GAO report on Canada, it does not, for a number of reasons, which I think other panelists will, will mention, accurately compare the prices of prescription drugs in Canada with those in the U.S. The GAO compared the best available price in Canada from the Ontario Drug Benefit Formulary with the published or sticker price in the United States. Of the 121 drugs compared in the study, as already been pointed out, more than one-third of them are available under the law you, you spearheaded in 1984 in the United States in generic form. And while there's an apples and oranges issue, that must be taken into account. The fact that 40 percent of the scripts in the United States are generic this year, 1993, that is a major cost reduction to American consumers brought about as a result of the Waxman-Hatch Bill in 1984. As this subcommittee well knows, the principal method the U.S. government has chosen to influence pharmaceutical market is to expedite the approval of generic versions of brand name drugs as soon as their patents uh, expire. One other problem with the GAO report, it considered only a selected non-random sample and did not compare total drug expenditures. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, and this is very important in my opinion, compares the overall expenditures of its member states on prescription and over-the-counter drugs. In 1990, the last year for which OECD data are available, Canada devoted 1.2 percent of its gross domestic product to the purchase of prescription and over-the-counter drugs compared with 1.0 percent uh, in the United States. Uh, Mr. Chairman, a member of the subcommittee, our country needs to ensure that all Americans have health care coverage with appropriate access to prescription drugs. We hope to participate with you, Mr. Chairman, and with this subcommittee and the Congress and the administration in an effort to devise comprehensive and fair health care reform that fully recognizes the key values of medicines in saving lives, perhaps it's just as importantly, not as emotionally, but in saving money in the great health care system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Mossinghef. Uh, why don't we just go down the, the, the line. Mr. Smith, why don't we have you next? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pull the microphone over and be sure to speak into it so we can get it all on the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the subcommittee, good morning to you. Well, I guess by now it's almost good afternoon. I'm Lee Smith, Vice Chairman of the Board of the Upjohn Company, which is a worldwide research-based manufacturer of pharmaceutical products with its headquarters in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I am pleased uh, today to testify on behalf of a company which has, for more than a century, provided important pharmaceutical therapies for a variety of illnesses. Mr. Mossinghoff mentioned technical difficulties with the GAO report, and in my written testimony illustrates examples of this specific to my company. In releasing the GAO report, members of this committee urged the U.S. to consider adopting the pricing practices of other countries or to get on the bandwagon. As a pharmaceutical executive who has lived and worked in Canada, Europe, and the United States, I respectfully disagree with that conclusion. The bandwagon is no place for a leader, and the U.S. is in the enviable position of being a world leader in the development of new, unique pharmaceuticals. Canada allows national and provincial authorities to determine reimbursement levels for pharmaceutical products. Those determinations are de facto price controls. And as a cost containment model, the Canadian system works fairly well, but it only succeeds as it does because Canada's southern neighbor fills much of the vacuum created by the paucity of Canadian drug research. The U.S. should not use another nation's pharmaceutical price regulation as a template for refashioning or undoing this country's free market system. U.S. legislators need to be aware of how differences in the Canadian system would, if implemented, result in very serious consequences for US health, the U.S. health care system. The Canadian system's differences include a lack of patent protection, a, limit of numbers of, a limited number of buyers, and random implementation of price controls. Because of these differences, Canadians lack a viable pharmaceutical industry. Few, if any, pharmaceutical products are being discovered there, and there's no significant expansion in pharmaceutical employment in Canada, and there is an ongoing trade imbalance. Indeed, a great deal of capital and a great number of jobs have left Canada because of its pricing and reimbursement regulations. Different systems, 
different objectives. Naturally, one would expect cross-border price differences. I feel, however, that the GAO report exploits those differences to serve an agenda rather than to provide an objective analysis. My written testimony addresses examples of those, and I won't go into it, but I would make the point that if appropriate comparisons are used, an analysis of the top 16 Upjohn products available in both the U.S. and Canada reveals that more than half of those have a higher cost in Canada than they do in the U.S. While others may frame the issue of price differentials as one of relative bargain, I prefer to discuss it in terms of absolute value. The Upjohn company prices its products in the U.S. according to investment in research and development, competition in the market, and the value realized by patients. Sixty percent of our market is here in the U.S. Without a free market available to guide pricing decisions within its home country, the Upjohn company would be forced to alter its R&D strategy by concentrating much more of it on applied or developmental research and much less in basic or discovery research. I suspect my counterparts would do the same. And this, I suggest, would be a great loss to the U.S. patients, to US, the health, U.S. health care system, and to future health care needs. Cross-border price differences are not confined to the U.S.-Canadian situation. In the European community, substantial pricing differences occur on a variety of items, including, including pharmaceutical products. In my experience, there's a steady inverse relationship between the level of price regulation and the level of research and development among the 12 EC nations. We should not ignore the contribution that the pharmaceutical companies make to the quality of life in the U.S. Last year, the U.S. pharmaceutical industry produced a $1.3 billion trade surplus, employed some 300,000 Americans, and in the process, produced the most cost-effective, least intrusive therapies available to millions of America who were sick. It is important to understand that at the current time, pharmaceutical prices are already being dramatically restrained. There are several causes, including increasing competition between single-source drugs, greater presence of generic products available on the market, and voluntary price constraints. These elements work to improve patient access to life-saving therapies within the free market environment. Mr. Chairman, I would like for you and other members of the subcommittee to understand, however, that I am not recommending perpetuation of the status quo by anyone, including the pharmaceutical industry. My company and the entire healthcare industry face a daunting task to change the system so that every American can afford health care. Upjohn is committed to the needs of the patient, not only the immediate need for effective therapy, but also to the long-term need for continual, vital, and increasingly efficient healthcare delivery. Upjohn's annual average price increase has been declining. Further, it anticipates that its average overall 1993 price increase will parallel changes in the consumer price index. In addition, the Upjohn company is maintaining and expanding upon its commitment to the health care needs of the indigent. We and other pharmaceutical companies regularly provide free medicines to many physicians with indigent patients. And the goal is to help such patients over extremely rough spots so that continuity in their health care won't have to fall prey to economic factors. Each month, my company processes hundreds of calls and letters from health care professionals and patients about this program. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith, for your testimony. Mr. Namath, could you, uh, you pull, pull the microphone a little Sorry. closer? Be sure to get it off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask that my entire testimony, which I have submitted, be included in that record. I'd like to make a short statement, a very short one, summarizing, the, uh, summarizing that testimony to ensure that uh, there is time for questions. My name is uh, Bob Nemeth. I'm the president of the International Pharmaceutical Group uh, at Pfizer. I've spent more than uh, 30 years managing Pfizer's international businesses, and I've resided in Africa, Far East, and Europe for more than two-thirds of that period. I'd like to cover three points today, and let me start with the U.S. market. This market is far more competitive and price-sensitive than the GAO report suggests. The report points to the Canadian province's power to exert pressure on pharmaceutical manufacturers' prices. Yet equally strong pressures on prices are enforced in the U.S. market today. These include aggressive generic competition, the growth of managed care, the emergence of numerous large buyers and buying groups, and the ever-present competition between, manu between pharmaceutical companies in our industry. The bottom line, I can assure you, sir, is competition and plenty of it. The GAO report does not reflect the impact of these important competitive factors in its calculations and misses the changes in the U.S. market that are occurring today and will continue to occur. Now I'd like to turn to my second point, 
the price comparisons in the report. I think the flaws in the GAO uh, report have uh, been uh, covered by others. I'd just like to comment on the fact that price differentials between uh, uh, the United States and, uh, and, and Canada are hardly unique. International price differences exist in virtually every sector for a whole array of essential goods and services, and these disparities reflect a variety of economic, political, and legal conditions. I suggest to you, Mr. Chairman, it would be strange indeed if price differences did not exist in two countries with such very different systems of government, health care, civil justice, public finance, and until this month, intellectual property rights. But I submit, and this is my third point, Mr. Chairman, there are trends in the rest of the world that do offer some policy lessons for us. Virtually all of the OECD countries are in the throes of health care reform driven, driven by fear of costs growing out of control. The systems reviewed by Dr. Wertharmer a short while ago are simply not working and the impulse for reform is stronger than ever in all of these countries. The irony is that most of these health care systems depend very heavily on price regulation and the rationing of medical services to contain costs. In fact, the European Commission recently prepared draft guidelines recommending that member states and direct government, I'm sorry, recommending to government states that direct government price controls on pharmaceuticals do not work and they should emphasize market approaches in the form of increased patient copayment and generic competition. In addition to being ineffective in holding down costs, there is strong evidence that stringent government controls on drug prices stifle innovation. For example, an International Trade Commission report prepared for the Senate Finance Committee recognized that the U.S as a premier innovative pharmaceutical industry in the world. It said, and I quote, the enactment of cost containment programs, price controls or both, on a national level often results in decreased levels of R&D spending. As we reform a health care system, we must be vigilant in ensuring that what we all want, new therapies to cure some of the most serious diseases known to man, will still be possible in our lifetimes. Supportive government policies are critical. And Pfizer is committed to working with you to ensure that government policies allow sufficient incentives and resources for the continued research and advancements in medical care that Americans want, expect, and deserve. But Mr. Chairman, I'd like to be clear about it, one thing else. We understand, we understand the need for fundamental reforms that address the issue of access. And we share, as human beings, as members of our society, the concern over the rising costs of U.S. health care. And in Pfizer, we've done what we could to help in the last couple of years. We've held our price increases to a lower rate of inflation. We'll do that in 93, and I will do our very best to do it for the foreseeable future. We believe, Mr. Chairman, that our major contribution will and should be the development of innovative medicines that treat specific conditions more effectively, conveniently, and in many cases at a lower cost than previously existing therapies. In addition, Mr. Chairman, we should be allowed to come to the table. We have remarkable wealth of experience around the world in things that have been tried around the world. We can inform the reform debate in a manner that I suggest you nobody else can. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to answering questions later. Thank you very much, Mr. Namath. Mr. Lane? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Richard Lane, and I am president of the U.S. Human Health Group of Merck & Company Incorporated a position I assumed January 1st of this year. Immediately prior to this, I headed Merck's West European business. We hope that by means of our testimony today, we can demonstrate that international price differences can and do occur for a variety of entirely legitimate reasons. Sometimes such differences can occur in spite of a company's best efforts, not because of them. May I have the first table, please? As the data in the GAO report show, of the seven Merck products patent protected in the United States in 1991, four were priced lower in the United States than they were in Canada. Further, if the total cost of these seven products for a consumer is weighted for the volumes actually sold in the United States in 1991, the price differential is less than one-tenth of one percent higher in the United States than Canada. That's a difference of only one penny for every ten dollars spent. Further, there are factors which are beyond the control of Merck, which make point-in-time comparisons of U.S. and foreign price levels problematic. One such factor is currency exchange rates. This past summer, for example, Merck introduced its new drug Proscar, a breakthrough for the treatment of enlarged prostate glands in older men. 
At its launch, we sought to establish a reasonable price, basically the same throughout the developed world. May I have the second chart, please? Our launch price was established at $1.40 per tablet in the United States by regulatory authorities at $1.57 in Italy and $1.41 in Sweden. Now, however, solely as a result of changes in currency exchange rates, the Italian pr price for Proscar is $1.33 and the Swedish price is $1.10. In other words, without any action by Merck whatsoever, International Proscar prices are now from 5 to 20 percent lower than in the U.S., even though they were at parity or higher than U.S. prices just months ago. We are committed to launching products globally at as close to equivalent prices as the various regulatory systems will allow. Moreover, in the U.S., we are committed to keeping our price increases within inflation. From 1973 through 1992, the average increase in Merck's total product line was exactly equal to the increase in the consumer price index over the same period of time. And since 1990, we have adhered to a policy of keeping our weighted average net price increase across our product line to within the forecasted CPI increase. We can also not overlook the fact that a significant number of Americans have no insurance for their pharmaceutical needs, while coverage may be available for their other health care needs. We believe that this coverage gap for such groups as the elderly and the poor who are not covered by Medicaid is inappropriate and costly. Consider, for example, that there were more than 700,000 hospitalizations in the United States for heart failure at an average cost of approximately $10,500 per hospitalization. Medicare pays over $5 billion each year for these hospitalizations, but does not pay $30 a month for a drug which has been shown to reduce such hospitalizations by up to 30 percent. If this drug could be made available to all heart failure patients in the United States, it could save as much as $1.4 billion per year. We must also remember the availability of generic competition in the United States. In 1984, under your leadership, Mr. Chairman, Congress adopted a strategy of reducing prescription drug costs in the United States by encouraging generic competition. As a result, more than one-third of the drugs studied by the GAO are available in the United States in generic form at prices significantly lower than those reflected in the study. The savings to consumers as a result of the landmark Waxman-Hatch Act should not be ignored. Indeed, Americans save much more from generics because more generics are used in this country than most other countries in the world. Mr. Chairman, Merck believes that the twin goals of reasonable pricing and access can be attained for the health care system. We also know that the long-term interests of the health care system are best served by an innovative pharmaceutical industry which invests significant sums in research and development and which can continue to lead the world in innovation and competitiveness. Merck has already met with the new administration to propose specific ways we can achieve measurable savings through voluntary price constraints. We are likewise eager to work with this subcommittee and your colleagues in Congress to construct a fair and reasonable voluntary pricing system to which everyone can subscribe. Thank you. I'd be happy to any answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Lane. <clears throat> Mr. Berndt? My name is Ernie Berndt. Got it? My name is Ernie Berndt. I'm Professor of Applied Economics at the MIT Sloan School of Management. I also serve there as head of the Economics, Finance, and Accounting Group. Together with other colleagues, I conduct pharmaceutical price research at the MIT program under the pharmaceutical industry and at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Much public attention has recently been focused on the pricing behavior of pharmaceutical companies, and in particular, on the apparently high rates of price increase experienced by prescription pharmaceutical products. I have studied trends in pharmaceutical prices extensively and have thought a great deal about drug price issues. Several months ago, the GAO undertook and published a study comparing U.S. and Canadian drug prices. Today I will comment briefly on the reliability of findings from that study. This external review is particularly appropriate, I believe, since the same U.S. data and similar analytical procedures apparently will form the basis of analyses in future GAO studies comparing U.S. prices with those in other countries. I expect that on average U.S. drug prices are in fact higher than those in Canada. There are several reasons for this. First, 
the costs of doing business in Canada are less than those in the U.S. In particular, given rather different legal systems, there's much lower exposure to product liability in Canada than in the U.S. I lived there for eight years. Canadians don't sue each other. We do. Second, since buying power is more concentrated in Canada, distribution and marketing costs are lower there as well. Third, and related, with buying power more concentrated in the Canadian provincial and federal governments than in the U.S., Canadian buyers are better able to exploit some of their buying power to obtain lower prices from drug manufacturers. Hence, I'm not surprised at all that the GAO study finds that on average, U.S. drug prices are higher than those in Canada. I believe, however, that these price differentials are grossly distorted and are exaggerated by the GAO, and most importantly, that the underlying data are unsuitable for serious public policy analysis. Let me be more specific. First, the Canadian prices are those paid by provincial governments, such as Ontario, who purchase in bulk quantities, while those for the U.S. are based on much smaller quantity presentational forms. Since volume purchases result in lower per unit price, it is clear that in this way the GAO methodology biases upward the U.S.-Canadian differential. Second, the GAO uses a variant of list price for the U.S., but a transactions price for Canada. Transactions prices are clearly lower than list prices, particularly when rebates are taken into account. There's one other comment I want to make concerning the GAO study. To comply with your request that the GAO study identify the causes of any documented price differentials, the GAO undertook a statistical analysis which led them to conclude, and I quote, price differentials are higher for drugs under PMPRB's jurisdiction, the PMPRB being the Patent and Medicine Price Review Board. I've examined the GAO statistical analysis and have obtained a copy of the data they employed. Using the same data and the same regression equation, I find that based on conventional statistical criteria, that the data are entirely consistent with an alternative notion, namely, that there's no impact on U.S. Canadian price differentials for drugs under varying form of the PMPRBs and for drugs listed under the ODB formulary. In summary, I do not believe that the GAO finding that U.S. drug prices are 32% higher than those for the identical drugs in Canada should be taken seriously. While I expect some differential, that number is simply too large. In my view, the GAO study is biased and its underlying data are dubious at best. Somewhat to my surprise, I've learned that Professor Schonelmeyer, a consultant to the GAO on this study, and sitting next to me here, apparently agrees with me and also finds serious faults in the GAO study. In remarks prepared for presentation to the House of Commons in Ottawa, Canada, on November 27, 1992, in conjunction with Bill C-91, Professor Schonelmeyer has written, referring to the GAO study further, and I quote, those findings, that is the GAO findings, were re-evaluated re for this report to determine what might be learned from the Canadian perspective. Figure 10 sh shows that compared to the U.S. price for a drug, Canadian prices were 12.2% lower. And that was for the entire 121 drugs. Now, I teach econometrics at MIT, but I do not see how prices 32% higher in the U.S. correspond with 12% lower in Canada. Indeed, it's striking to me that a principal consultant to this study appears to disagree quite strongly with its most visible finding. Obviously, I'm interested in hearing why this was taken out of context since I have this, this study right here. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I want to comment briefly on the uses of the Medispan wholesale acquisition price data to measure rates of drug price change in the U.S. Professor Schonelmeyer has argued in other contexts that list prices and average transactions prices have a constant relationship to each other. One minute, please. Uh, so that while their levels are different, their rates of price change are the same over time. I disagree strongly. I believe list prices rise more rapidly for two reasons. First, there's clear contradictory evidence. For example, in a classic study, the Nobel laureate in economics, George Stigler, found that over the 1962 to 66 time period, on average over a substantial number of products, quoted selling prices rose more rapidly than transactions prices. While differences varied across products, in the context of today's hearing, it's useful to examine what happened to tranquilizers. Here, Stigler Kindall found that even as list prices rose 1.4% over the five-year period, 
average transactions prices actually fell 14 percent. The reason why list price changes overstate actual pr transactions price changes, according to Stigler and Kindall, is that there are asymmetrical inertia in industrial price movements. In particular, price declines are not incorporated into list price reductions um, very quickly, whereas in response to price uh, transactions price increases are ratified by raises and list prices rather quickly. Thank you very much, Mr. Burnt. The rest of that statement is going to be in the record. Uh, Dr. Schonemeyer, I want to hear from you next. Uh, you had a uh, prepared statement that, to give us, and that's in the record, and I know you plan to take five minutes, but you have had your name raised uh, uh, by a number of other witnesses, and I, I think it'd be fair to give you a little extra time if you want to respond to those other witnesses. If, 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 uh, if nobody objects, we'll give you an extra two minutes. Does anybody have any problem with that? You're going to give Dr. Um, Professor Burnt an extra two minutes to finish, and I don't have any objection. Do you want an extra two minutes, Ms. Dr. Burnt? Yeah. You do, huh? Well, then, uh, Mr. Schonemeyer, we'll just give you five, and then we'll see if we can pick it up in the questions. <laughs> Uh, no, we're going to have Mr. Schondelmeyer. You went first? That's okay. fine. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what would you prefer, that I address the uh, challenges or well, well, give I'm my prepared to, uh, statement? I'm going to let or you blend? do that during my question period. Okay. So why don't you uh, give us your testimony? Sure. I, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. I feel much like the shepherd boy David among the giants, uh, the Goliath sitting with me down the row. Uh, I respect these individuals very much and their companies and what they've contributed to our society. I think there's some public policy questions that we need to address too that this industry has been largely unwilling to address over time. And often we come into conflict uh, because we ask questions from a different perspective. In fact, most of the conflict and discrepancies you see here are because we're asking different questions from different perspectives using the same set of data. That is, I approach this issue from what is the impact on the individual consumer and the aggregate of separate markets of individual consumers in this marketplace, whereas my colleagues down the row here are asking the question from the point of view of what is the impact on an individual pharmaceutical company and pharmaceutical manufacturers as a whole. Certainly macroeconomics is a sum of the whole of microeconomics, but each of these markets uh, add up to equal that whole, and not every separate market is equal to the average that you can spread across all of those markets. And so we can make some uh, very erroneous uh, mistakes by assuming that all of the markets are the same. I would like to touch on four basic issues. First, international differences in price level for drugs. Second, international differences in rate of increase in drug price levels. Third, the growth in what I call the premium price paid in the United States. And then fourth, policy implications for the United States that we need to address. First of all, we've heard that uh, international drug price differences, whether we accept the exact number in the uh, Canadian GAO study or some plus or minus X percent of that number, or any other study we've seen in the literature, every study that's out there for the most part says there are differences, and in fact, uh, the individuals down there all have admitted that there are differences. The U.S. in general pays the highest price. So let me move on to the second point. That's international differences in the increase in drug price inflation. In general, our inflation rate in the United States has been the highest for drug prices of most countries, most developed countries at least in the world also. Canada has slowed its rate of inflation to be equal to or slower than the overall consumer price index in their own market with respect to pharmaceuticals. In the European market, uh, various sources indicate that the rate of inflation is in the range of 1 to 3 or 4 percent, also equal to or in most cases below the rate of inflation in those societies. We've been averaging much higher percentages in the U.S. In the early part of this uh, decade, the five years, 1983 to 87, we had an 8.1% increase in pharmaceutical prices. In the last five years, 88 to, 82, to 92, the percentage increase has slowed to uh, uh, about 7.1%. Uh, in the last year, our average increase over the last year averages at 6.4%. And this industry has done a lot to slow their rate of inflation for pharmaceutical prices. I congratulate them on that and encourage them to keep up the good work and the voluntary action. I think, though, in any industry, we need benchmarks to measure against. A reasonable benchmark to look at is the uh, producer price index for finished goods or the consumer price index for all items. 
And we find that when we compare the rate of pharmaceutical inflation to either of those, that pharmaceutical inflation is still three to six times faster than either the manufacturing sector of our economy or the overall consumer sector of our economy. So we're still growing in terms of prices for pharmaceuticals much faster than the consumer's ability to pay for those pharmaceuticals. So pharmaceuticals have been, and, and at least at present, are still a growing part of our gross national product. Uh, I would comment that real growth in an economy does not come from price increase. It comes from unit volume, uh, new products, breakthrough products, and valuing properly those products in the marketplace. In some cases, we have products in the U.S. that are perhaps undervalued. Other cases, we have products that are certainly overvalued and paying 15 percent more each year for the same product that we've had for 40 years isn't necessarily uh, in the consumer's best interest. What I would say then is we have what I would call a premium price that we pay in the U.S. We have across certain markets in the U.S. the highest price in the world and the highest rate of inflation in the world. And if that continues, if we already have the highest price and the highest rate of inflation, it means that that gap will only continue to grow wider unless we find some either voluntary or public policy approach that brings about a leveling out the rate of inflation, we will continue to pay an ever-growing price premium. I think as an American society, as others have said, we're willing to pay a price premium. We value this industry, we value their R&D, we value the product of that R&D, what it brings to the consumer. But the real value of their product is not measured in the amount they spend on R&D or the amount that a pharmacist charges for their product but it's measured in the amount that an individual patient's health care improves because of use of that product. Okay, quick comment. I think uh, several things we need to look at. We need to, as a society, begin to ask what is a reasonable price to pay for both existing and new products in this market. Have some level of accountability. With every other sector of the health care industry, we have accountability. We know the cost structure of the hospital market, of physicians, of retail pharmacies, of other providers in health care. We know less about pharmaceuticals and their cost structure than any other major sector of our health care industry. Pharmaceuticals are the third largest sector. Also, drug companies keep asking for that free market, the competitive market. This market does not approximate a competitive free market. One of the most basic hallmarks of a free market is free and ready access to the consumer to price and quality information about a product. Not only can consumers not find reasonable price information in various markets for pharmaceuticals, but even researchers such as myself and such as the GAO and you as members of Congress have difficulty finding this information. This is a free and competitive market. Let's look for policies that require that that information be general and publicly available. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Schonelmeyer. Your last point raises a question that I wanted to ask of the witnesses from the pharmaceutical industry, because the industry has been willing to, to uh, make its research costs public. This is unaudited information, but at least it's a start. There are two other pieces of information that you indicated are critical for us to know. The first is prices charged to large purchasers, and the second is costs of advertising and promotion. First, I, I want to... Uh, confirm my assumption and ask each of the members of the panel representing a company whether I am correct that your company does not make available to the public information concerning the prices you charge to purchasers such as HMOs, hospitals, insurance companies, and other large purchasers. And second, I want to ask whether I am correct that your companies do not release information on how much your company spends on marketing and advertising. Mr. Smith, why don't we start with you? I, I think on the, the answer, to the, Mr. Chairman, the answer to the first question, uh, generally prices are, even though they may be quantity, prices are available. Where maybe, uh, and I don't know where the, where the GAO ran a difficulty, but maybe one of the places where it is a bid and tender situation, and I don't know any industry that releases their bid and tender uh, information. For example, a big MHO on a multiple source product will ask for bids bids are put in, that information is not publicly available. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my expertise and experience is in the international marketplace, so I really can't comment on the first question. Second question is, uh, no, we do not release detailed information on our marketing uh, expenditures because they would be information of great value to uh, our competitors. We have, however, I believe some years ago submitted to you a rather detailed uh, exposition of, uh, of our marketing uh, expenses and I believe uh, Senator Kennedy some years ago also uh, acquired some information and then of course a lot of information is available publicly through audits uh, of promotional spend and detailing activity so it's not as if it's a totally opaque situation. 
Mr. Lane. Thank you, sir. I would uh, echo the comments of uh, my two predecessors. Much of that information is considered proprietary. However, I think with uh, adequate assurances of confidentiality, we would be willing to share that information with members of this subcommittee privately. Now, you, you, you want it all to be kept confidential. You, you want uh, maybe some people in Congress to know or the Health Care Financing Administration under the Medicaid law to know, but you don't want the public to know. Uh, and yet we're told that uh, when we look at the prices in other countries, we should accept the fact that the prices here are reasonable and uh, the public is not being gouged. If I asked each of the three of you to furnish this subcommittee a list for the last three years of the prices charged for each of your drugs to all purchasers, and second, for each of the last three years, the amount that your company spent on drug advertising promotion and marketing and the percentage that that figure represents of the total sales for your company. Will you furnish it to us, Mr. Lane? Uh, I believe we would. Okay. Mr. Namath? I would have to uh, go back and ask, ask my uh, people in New York, but I, uh, I, 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 as an individual, I, I see no reason why we would not do that. Okay, Mr. Smith? Yes. Okay. And Mr. Mossinghoff? I'd like to make the same request of the 15 largest drug companies who are members of the PMA who are not testifying here today. Let me make that request to each of you uh, and ask that you uh, comply, get the information to us in the uh, next uh, 15 days. Mr. Pollack testified uh, that the price increases for the top 20 drugs, uh, that several of these drugs are manufactured by companies represented here today. For example, between 1985 and 1991, the price of Pfizer's Procardia rose by 90 percent. The price of Upjohn Xanax rose by 106 percent. The price of Merck's Clinaril rose by 82 percent. That's bad enough if we're talking about an introductory price of a drug being high, but at least there's something of an argument that the price is justified by high research costs. But the question I want to ask is what justifies these extraordinary price increases after a drug has already been introduced, it's been on the market. How can, how can we see such uh, large increases and what can justify it? First of all, Representative from Pfizer. Namath, for Mr. Cardio, Chairman, 90% increase. I can't comment on that, Mr. Chairman. Oh, simply because, as I said, I don't have anything to do with the operation of the U.S. pharmaceutical. If you say it was 90%, I'm sure it was 90%. Okay, how about, uh, uh, so, uh, Mr. Lane, for upside, Xanax rose 106 percent. Xanax, I would have to defer to Mr. Excuse me, Mrs. Sir. <laughs> um, Xanax rose. Xanax was introduced with one indication, uh, as approved by the FDA. Subsequently, there were several additional indications and disease entities that were identified that the product was useful for. Research was ongoing. Clinical research, in particular, was ongoing to justify. Uh, those new indications and applications to the, F the FDA. And Mr. Lane, why don't you tell us about the other With respect to Clinaril, I would uh, submit that uh, I think the more important issue is that we haven't raised the price of Clinaril at all since 1990. But uh, between 85 and 91, the uh, Clinaril price rose by 82 percent. When did Clinaril first come on the market? Clinaril came on the market, I believe, in 1978. Now, what happened between 1985 and 1991 to justify an 82 percent increase in this one drug? That's already had already been on the market since '78, so that was by uh, seven years. Uh, I believe that the price of that product was raised for a variety of reasons, including competitive reasons, the cost of uh, the increase in the uh, uh, CPI at the time. Um, CPI by 82 percent in part, in part by competitive reasons. I thought you lowered the prices for competitive reasons, not raise the prices for competitive reasons. Where there's a competitive opportunity to increase our price, we will. <laughs> and that's an interesting statement. Where there's a competitive reason to raise your price, you will. It sounds to me like if you don't have competition, then you can raise your price. Um, I don't believe that's completely true. Professor Burnt, uh, did 
the GAO statistical analysis show that the Canadian regulatory system contributes to lower prices in Canada? The report claimed that, uh, however, using standard statistical procedures, uh, one cannot reject the alternative notion that the regulatory bodies had no impact on contributing to price differentials. Let me state that I'm not sure I believe that last result. I think what it underlines instead is that the data is so poor for this study that it's hard to reject any hypothesis. Could you comment on Dr. Schonelmeyer's paper concerning his reevaluation of the GAO data? I can't. I would be delighted to see how he can. Would you, Dr. Schonelmeyer? I'd, I'd be pleased to. First of all, I'd say when one is asked a, a research question, uh, uh, it can, I'm certainly uh, glad to have the critique of that, and I appreciate Dr. Burns' critique. Uh, I think, though I find Dr. Burns in much the position that Emily Latella is on Saturday Night Live uh, when she's told that, no, we ask a different question, never mind. He was addressing and critiquing the study as if we would ask the question in the context of what was the impact of market conditions on price differences uh, in terms of the total revenue of pharmaceutical manufacturers. Though his critiques addressed that type of research question. That wasn't our research question at all. Our research question was what was the uh, relevant price change or a relevant price for uh, the typical American and for the typical Canadian. And we addressed that. With respect to my comment quoted out of the study, um, first of all, the document he's quoting from is a summary of what I did for that study. And I have a copy here as well, so you don't need to dig yours out, um, unless yours has something different than mine does. Uh, the, uh, first of all, when I said in my quote that this is from the Canadian perspective, I used the uh, Canadian price as the denominator rather than the U.S. price, which makes the percentage look smaller. So to say that in the U.S. our prices are 33% higher than Canada, uh, actually I used the reverse, to say our prices are 33% higher than Canada is the same as saying that Canadian prices are 24% lower than U.S. prices. So that's a 24% difference. The second thing, that's just using a different denominator, and I'd be glad to show you the math if you can't comprehend that right now. Secondly, uh, uh, I would say that uh, in Canada, I had available to me information on sales in Canada, the relative sales weight of each of the items in that price study, and so I did a weighted index in the Canadian market uh, because I had that data available, and that weighted index did reduce the price difference to 12.2%, which is exactly what I quoted in here. In the United States market, the GAO uh, had requested such information, but through a variety of uh, topics and issues, they were not able to get sales-weighted data to do the study as we had originally planned. So uh, we could have done it in the U.S. with sales weighting if we had it available, too. I'd be glad to show the math to Dr. Byrne or anybody else that would like to see it. There's nothing inconsistent with my comment in that study, and I used the same data. I didn't change any data, any drugs. Uh, I did use Canadian weighting, and I did use it from the Canadian perspective, how much less are their prices than Americans, rather than how much more are ours than theirs. Doc, Dr. Byrne, would you care to comment? Uh, if the number using U.S. weighting is 12.2% as well, which or, or four-thirds of that, uh, that would be entirely consistent. Uh, it's a dramatic change, however, to go from 33% to 25% and then from 25 down to 12. It refer, and it reflects entirely the weighting issue. And I think one of the faults with the GAO study is that this uh, simple arithmetic mean weighting does not reflect at all the relative importance in the marketplace of the differing drugs and entirely ignores the generics. Thank you. Mr. Lane, what are your views on the role of, that generic drugs can play in controlling health care costs? I think they play a significant uh, role in controlling health care costs. As a matter of fact, when uh, I ran our European business, I lobbied quite extensively with European governments to enact um, a policy similar to the Waxman-Hatch Act in this, in this country as, as methods for controlling their drug costs. I believe I was even quoted in the December issue of the pink sheet uh, favoring that position. Why do drug companies, uh, Mr. Lane, spend so much on promoting their products? I, I prefer the uh, term education. Um, if, if, if I could have the, the, uh, the, the chart, please. Um, at the launch of any product, the, the, uh, the major base of knowledge about the appropriate use of that product, 
the scientific information necessary for physicians to use that product appropriately is in the hands of a pharmaceutical company. It's a very significant scientific undertaking for, uh, for the company to transfer that knowledge uh, from years of research from the company to physicians. What you have over there is the FDA labeling for a product that's pretty similar for most. I believe that's for our product, Vasatech. It's our responsibility, indeed moral obligation, to ensure that physicians understand all of that information so that they can properly use those products in the right patients at the right time, at the right dose, so that they understand what precautions they should be using and when they shouldn't use the product. That's necessarily very complex and labor-intensive effort, and that's what contributes quite significantly to the cost of promotion in this industry. Does it cost more to do it for, for consumers in this country than it does in Canada? Uh, I, I, I can't comment. I believe it probably costs about the same. Even though you have to print it in two languages in, in Canada? It probably costs more from that perspective. Uh, on an absolute basis, it probably costs more in the sense that uh, most of this is done by professional representatives well, and we're required to have a sales force in each of those countries to do these types of things. The, the, uh, one last question, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate your indulgence. Why won't Canada's system of price controls work in the United States? Is that directed to me again? Sure is. Uh, I don't, I don't believe it's needed as, as the prices for Merck's more recent introductions, the last seven products that we've introduced in Canada and the United States, as my testimony demonstrated, the uh, prices are very similar. Uh, so the question I would ask is why, why would we implement one more bureaucratic process to, uh, to try and do what's already happening? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Blaney. Mr. Wyden. Uh, Mr. Lane, I heard your statement to Chairman Waxman give it back to you. You said when there's a competitive reason to raise prices, you're going to do it. That seems to me to be another example of what I've called this kind of God-given right to wring out just as much money as you possibly can from the U.S. consumer. Now, is there any other possible analysis that one could make about your statement other yeah. than you just want to charge just as much as you possibly can get whenever there's an opportunity. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I think there is a, a different interpretation. Um, and I would uh, turn to uh, a statement that Dr. Schondelmeyer made, and that is that uh, I think he said that some products may have uh, um, be undervalued in this country. We believe that that was one such product. And uh, we were merely uh, undertaking pricing efforts to, uh, to put that product it in better perspective vis-a-vis -vis the competitive products in terms of the value it was providing and the return we were getting. But what's wrong with making sure that the consumer gets a fair shake for every product and set up a true marketplace system so that people can get a fair shake for whatever they need? I mean, what you all seem to be doing is setting yourselves up as sort of a, a kind of governmental body that's going to make judgments about when you might want to subsidize one in order uh, to deal with what you think is a shortfall of revenue in another area. Why not set up a system so that we have real marketplace forces, have real negotiating power so the consumer can get a fair shake for each drug, rather than my consumers will certainly be very unhappy with the answer you uh, gave for the particular product in question. I believe that system is in place and, is, and, and that the uh, industry is moving in the direction that you're asking. If that specific product, looking at uh, more recent data, the price is raised by only 13% since 1989. Further, as I said in my testimony, Merck has now pledged itself since 1990 to raise its prices no greater than the rate of inflation. And we have adhered to that, and we will continue to adhere to that. I, I'm very aware that Merck has made progress on a, on a number of these drugs, and it's to be appreciated. My only concern is, unless there's fairness for a particular product that a consumer needs, you really don't have the kind of marketplace system that you all say you want. What you have is this kind of drug company appointed authority to subsidize one product when you consider it uh, to your advantage. And I think we ought to go to a real marketplace where instead of uh, you all deciding what to subsidize and what not to, we have some fairness uh, for the consumer. Is, is that a question or a... Well, no, you, you already told us that you felt you had a God-given right to get as much out of that product as you could because you thought something else was undervalued. I mean, I, 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 heard, I heard you say that, 
And I understand that you all have appointed yourselves up as the authority to make a determination of what ought to be a, an appropriate subsidy. I don't think that's right. When a consumer needs one drug, they ought to get a fair shake for that drug, and we ought to have a marketplace system that gets them, gets them that fair shake. Mr. Chairman? What I don't understand is you just made a pledge, and I think some of the other companies have seemed to be making the same statement, that you're not going to be raising prices for your drugs for the future more than the consumer price index. Is that, is that your pledge, Mr. Lane? On a, on a cross our product line basis, that is the pledge we have made, yes. Now, now how, how, it's interesting this pledge is being made at a time when the pharmaceutical industry is under a great deal of scrutiny for the kind of price increases we've seen in the past. Why do you make a pledge like that? What, what if you had a drug like uh, Clinirol, for whatever reason you had a competitive uh, so-called opportunity on a drug that I presume you had a patent and therefore monopoly price over, you rose uh, that, uh, the price of that one by 82 percent from 85 to 91. W why make a pledge to us now not to take advantage of those opportunities in the future? Aren't you doing a disservice to your stockholders? What we are doing is... Or are you trying to avoid the American people being outraged and being gouged by these kinds of price increases and you want to ward off legislation that might try to get something done to hold down price increases? The reason I ask that is some of us who've been around remember when President Carter proposed hospital cost containment and the hospital industry came in and said, we want a voluntary effort. We will pledge a voluntary effort to hold down costs. And it lasted so long as the threat of legislation hung over their head. And when that threat was gone, the prices for hospital care zoomed way up out of control. It, it, perhaps you want to respond, uh, and I'll be glad to give Mr. Wyden more time if everybody else will agree to that. I, I believe that the, uh, that the actions of Merck are an indication of our concern with health care costs in the United States, the rise in those costs, and our desire to contribute success to a successful solution. We volunteered in 1990 to contribute to, to, to that cause. We've adhered to that, uh, that uh, promise. Uh, and we look forward to working with the administration and members of Congress to find other ways uh, to work together to uh, solve the health care cost problem. Just a couple of other questions, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mossy. I'm going to be given two additional, two additional minutes and we'll extend additional time to others as well. Mr. Mossy Huff, isn't it a little bit unfair for your member companies to criticize the GAO and its methodology when your companies wouldn't furnish them good pricing data so they could have been as exact as possible in their analysis? Well, Mr. White, I don't know what our companies were asked to provide or whether they, they did or the didn't. The GAO said that they were not furnished pricing data by PMA companies. Well, I heard the testimony this morning. As I say, I don't know which companies and what they were asked to do. Uh, it is certainly a flaw in the, in the, from an academic point of view, as we've heard, it is a flaw in the study that it did not take into account even the Medicaid rebates, which are known to the government uh, through the, through the uh, OBRA 90 uh, legislation. The PMA, <coughs> our, our staff, cooperated with the GAO <coughs> in their methodology and pointed out early on that they were comparing apples and oranges in this, in this study, which I think is really the case. The, the GA, GAO said you all did not cooperate. That was the point. They said they couldn't get good pricing data and uh, well, we, Mr. Chairman, we don't, PMA does not have pricing data. No, but your companies were in a position to give the GAL the information they needed so they could have been as exact as possible. Your companies wouldn't do it, and yet PMA companies and PMA have been very critical of GAO. Now, if you all want the Hutzpah Award, we can give it to you, but uh, I think uh, it's certainly a little bit unfair to not furnish the data and criticize. Let me ask one last question in terms of my time. What my constituents ask more than anything else is why so much money has to be spent on marketing. And they look at these drugs, for example, like Paxol, that sell themselves, essentially, where the price the government paid for Taxol was like 60 to 90 cents per milligram. Bristol-Myers is charging $4.80 per milligram. We asked why. They said it was marketing, advertising, that kind of thing. Why do your companies have to spend so much on marketing, particularly for these products that virtually sell themselves when they shoot out the door, like Taxol. How do we get Mr. Smith and Mr. I have a, a 
we want to get a, re a response to the question. Well, I would say that, that most of the marketing, there's a lot of, lot of, of uh, sort of inaccurate statements thrown around. Marketing is somehow uh, made synonymous with advertising. Uh, the Schoenfeld uh, study, which is the, the industry standard for, for, more, for advertising as such, indicates that our industry, now it's the pharmaceutical industry from the, uh, the uh, uh, ethical side and from the over-the-counter side, spends about 5.8% in 1992 of its sales on advertising. That's about one-third of the R&D that we spend. That's advertising. If you go to the other areas, a lot of it is, is uh, not even non-specific educational opportunities for doctors to use these drugs. It's detailing uh, representatives, the sales representatives, who, uh, as Mr. Lane pointed out, have a very, very uh, responsible job to do to explain to a doctor everything that's, that's needed to be explained. Most of the drugs that are being used Routinely now, we're not there when doctors got out of medical school. They really do need uh, that, kind of, that kind of education. It's interesting, in the UK, uh, they exempt medical information from promotion. They say that medical information is not part of the promotion budget that, that were, were talked about today. So there is an awful lot in the so-called promotion, and well, in the advertising, it's not all advertising, and in the promotion that is basically a very high-grade Let's move on to other members, and, and if uh, your colleagues at the table want to jump in on some other question, perhaps they will have an opportunity. Mr. Who would be next? Mr. McMillan, I think you would be I'm next. I'm not sure what the batting order is. I went to the bullpen for a few minutes. And, uh, okay, well, let, let's go to uh, Mr. Upton then. Whatever. I'm, I'm ready. Oh, you're ready? Yeah. Oh, I'm, and you're recognized for five oh, I'm ready. If you I, need I would time, like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Burnt and... Uh, Dr. Schundelmeyer for casting some light on the GAO study which we examined in the first panel. And I think you've helped us understand it a little bit better. I think the methodology is not uh, appropriate and doesn't present an accurate picture, although it may have been um, due somewhat to the limitations imposed on it. And I think, uh, Dr. Burnt, you, you pointed out that there are a number of cost factors that represent differentials between the Canadian and the U.S. Uh, production environment, not the least of which are regulatory and legal, uh, that may have a considerable impact on, on costs, and I, I appreciate you for bringing that to our attention. Um, I'd like to ask one other question uh, to probe a little further one thing Dr. Schundelmeyer said, having to do with the relationship between inflation and drug prices, and I think you, uh, you pointed out the fact that uh, pharmaceutical prices uh, have a rate of inflation far in excess of other components of the economy. But you didn't comment on the fact that uh, they also occur in an environment in which medical care costs also uh, generally are, are accelerating at multiples of the, uh, uh, of the rest of the economy, maybe on a magnitude of 14 to 15 percent per year, in an area in which the government probably tr attempts to exercise more cost control, and inadequately so, than perhaps any other segment of the economy. W would you care to uh, offer any uh, comments that may suggest some parallels between pharmaceutical prices and overall health care costs, which are maybe a, a lack of competitiveness? Actually, with respect to overall health care costs, they have been one of the leading inflating sectors of our economy in the last decade. Certainly, pharmaceuticals have been at the front edge of that sector. Uh, they weren't necessarily the fastest inflating throughout the whole decade, but on average, uh, they were at the top edge, inflating faster than, uh, uh, for most of the time, hospitals or physician uh, services or costs. Uh, so pharmaceuticals, uh, certainly you could argue they're keeping up with the Joneses in terms of the rest of the healthcare system, but you could also argue that, uh, you know, Mom, I did it because everybody else was, so I jumped over the cliff too. Uh, Someone, so, perhaps not you, made the comment that the person ordering the product is not the one paying for it, which is fundamentally the problem with our health care right. system. I would argue that, that we have a, do not have a basic traditional market structure in health care at all anyway, which is part of that. Uh, I think also a comment Dr. Burnt made about the Canadian market, I'd like to point out a, a difference there. Uh, he commented that in Canada, they had concentrated buying power in the provinces. And indeed, the provinces do buy and have considerable buying power. But in the U.S., a company like a chain, like Walgreens, spends about $2 billion a year on prescription drugs, 
more than any province in Canada and about half of the total Canadian expenditures on pharmaceuticals. And for most of those products we studied in the GAO study, Walgreens is probably paying more for those products also than those Canadian provinces. So, and Walgreens... We tend to compare Walgreens with the Canadian price structure instead of some other... Uh, We'd be glad to do that too. And I think Walgreens... that's what you're saying in, when you make references to waiting, are you not? Well, I would be glad would to use waiting if somebody would provide price. the data to me that would allow me to do that. Yeah. It certainly was the intent in our design when we began the process, and uh, given time and cost constraints of the government, we weren't able to obtain that. I think uh, uh, also Walgreens takes delivery of the product in their own warehouses. The Canadian provinces don't. The product is still distributed through normal retail community pharmacies in Canada. So if we're talking about cost and delivery differences, uh, there are a number of differences in, in buyers in the U.S. with far more power than those provinces, and yet we don't see them getting the same level of price. Well, what I didn't see evidence of in the GAO report was evidence of discounts, volume discounts that may be available to big segments of the American market through a Walgreens or an yeah. Eckers or whoever the case may be. That's an important point, and let me explain why we didn't include that in our study. Because, again, we were focusing on the typical consumer. Sir, when you go in to buy a prescription, do you get a Medicaid discount on that prescription? I do, don't believe you do. No, do I you, don't. Do you get a hospital discount? I'm not aware of any discounts I've got. Okay, so that's my point. As a typical consumer, you don't get any of those discounts. The drug company has to take those discounts. If you're answering the question, what is the impact on the drug company, those discounts are quite relevant. But if we're asking the impact on the typical consumer, such as yourself, those discounts First of all, I don't get those discounts, and secondly, I don't need the entire line of Merck's products when I go in to have one prescription filled. Even though they're all very valuable, useful products in the market, I need one product, and I have to pay that price without discounts. Well, I think you mentioned something else that I think we need to probe. Can I have a couple additional minutes? Without a, a, a objection, the gentleman will be given two additional minutes. That, that's in the nature of the product. And then, in fact, can we have true price competition? And a lot of that has to do with the so-called education or promotion or advertising mm -hmm. or awareness. And I would have to confess is one that, you know, uh, likes to think that I'm uh, aware of products that I buy. In fact, I've, you know, run a chain that included eight uh, retail drug stores. Okay. Um, but but co uh, product awareness in something like this is, is very low compared to most other segments of the economy. And, uh, and I think maybe there are some things that we can probe that the, um, and the pharmaceutical industry can help us with respect to uh, developing comparative information that, that um, allow more price competition uh, and comparison of the uh, quality of the product. Um, I don't take a lot of offense at the notion that someone can arbitrarily raise prices. Now, the gentleman from Oregon is uh, one of his basic industries out there is the lumber industry, and it's got more free wheel pricing than uh, practically any other industry I know of. And I've not noted uh, a lot of those sawmill operators thinking about the social consequences of raising the prices of two by fours when they can get it, because there are a lot of other times when they lose. And I would like to ask the question generally, are, are there loss leaders in this industry? Do you take losses on products? We seem to be talking about... Uh, strictly gouging, as it's said, on some products. I would suspect that there are a lot of losses you're taking. And the other question related thereto would be in U.S. pricing, and perhaps um, uh, Mr. Namath would like to answer this in contrast, say, to U.K. pricing or some other country, do you feel like you have to absorb in your U.S. price structure a research and development expense or cost that has denied you in other regulated systems uh, in which you compete? If you could answer those two questions. Um, we view ourselves as a global pharmaceutical company. And we believe that we have a unique product that we have a responsibility to make available to people in every country in the world. Uh, we have to make that product available in a manner that people can afford to pay for it. And I'd like to just for a moment touch on, on, on Mexico. Uh, a lot of people seem to be puzzled I mean, in that kind of puzzled why are prices in Mexico, and I'm making up a number, 25% of the prices in, uh, in the United States. The fact is people in Mexico, their ability to buy something is probably 10% 
of people in the United States. So we're going to make a drug available or, or medicine that people, uh, we believe they need in Mexico, they do need it. We cannot price it at the U.S. level. You price it at the U.S. level, whereas we have those Americans who live in, in Texas who cross over to Mexico to buy their drugs uh, you, because they can't afford it, and that's regrettable, and we've got to do something about that. But the other part of it is if we price drugs in Mexico, or pharmaceuticals or drugs, whatever you want to call them, in Mexico at that price, nobody would have any drug because they couldn't afford it. So that's the primary reason why you see differentials around the world. People cost more in the United States than they do in Mexico. Our promotional expenses in Mexico are a lot less expensive than they are because a detail man in Mexico or a person gets a lot less money. So it's a very, I'm using that as an illustration, it's a very complicated situation, but at the end of the day, none of us sits down and says, well, you know, we got to charge more in the United States because we got to give the folks in Mexico our products at a lower price. We market our products around the world into 140 different markets with different circumstances in every market, and we have a responsibility to make that product available. I don't know if that's exactly the answer. Question to the exact uh, the you. answer to the exact question answered, sir. But Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Uh, mm. Mr. Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a couple of questions of Professor Burnt. Um, could you familiarize me with? Um, I see in your prepared remarks that you do research at the MIT program on pharmaceutical industry. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about that program, sir? It's a program started about a year ago, funded entirely by the Sloan Foundation at this point in time. It's a program that's uh, part of the Sloan Greater Program and looking at various American industries to find out what makes some more competitive internationally than others. I see. And what is the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation? It's a charitable foundation set up by the founder of General Motors originally. I see. And, and this program is entirely directed toward the pharmaceutical industry? The Sloan Foundation funded different programs at different universities. There's one at the textile industry, I believe, at Harvard. There's some on high-tech industries and semiconductors in uh, Silicon Valley and things like that. But the one at MIT is... Is, is the only one, in, to the best of my knowledge, on the pharmaceutical industry, sir. And is the only one in the country, to your knowledge? Uh, I'm sure there are other programs that do research in the pharmaceutical industry. I don't uh, know their names, but uh, I suspect there are other places as well. I right. believe you have one there. Right. What is the National Bureau of Economic Research? The National Bureau of Economic Research is an independent think tank uh, in Cambridge that has applied economists from all over the country uh, doing research through its various programs. Uh, the program that I'm involved in is a program on productivity growth and technological change. And you applied the knowledge and, and research that you are involved in generally, in this specific instance, to the data with respect to the pharmaceutical industry. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And what was the, <coughs> excuse me, if I may know, was there a particular reason why you directed your attention to this, or was there a request that you do so? The, we were interested in the pharmaceutical industry for a number of reasons. Um, there, my co-author on some work there is a gentleman named Zvi Grilikas, who is a president of the American Economic Association and has done a lot of work on a diffusion of technological change. Uh, we are interested in that industry because uh, we have a general concern on the accuracy of our pricing data. And it was our view that if we took the careful look at the pricing data in some of our high-tech industries, such as pharmaceuticals, we might understand better to what extent are our pricing data actually capturing representative transactions. So we chose that industry since everyone else was doing computers. Uh, we chose the uh, pharmaceutical. Uh, would, and, and not for the purpose of this meeting, but, but would that have to do with an attempt to break apart the co claim components in pricing data to determine um, vis-a-vis -vis technology, whether you in fact can produce a product for less with the greater amount of technology as opposed to more labor-intensive industries? Eventually we may get to that point. In, in, our initial work has just been to try and measure uh, more accurately, we believe, with what in fact have been tr pricing trends in this industry. And we have uh, worked 
together with folks at the Bureau of Labor Statistics on that, and one of our principal findings was that because of the sampling procedures that are followed by the BLS, it's quite likely, indeed, it, we suspect very clearly the case that price increases are, as measured by the producer price index for this industry, overstate true rates of inflation. And what accounts for that? The primary reason is that the BLS only changes a sample frame every six years. That is a product of goods it samples. Mm -hmm. And it so happens that in this industry, that means that you're primarily sampling older products. Older products in this industry tend to have higher rates of <coughs> excuse me, price increase than do younger products. As a result, the oversampling of older products together with their higher price increases meant roughly speaking that over the 1985 to 1990 time period, uh, while the official price index grew about 9% a year, uh, a more reasonable one based on index number approaches, uh, I think even BLS folks agree with it would be about 6% a year. It's interesting that you would look at that. Would that also then take into account the fact that if you, since you're using old data, that you don't get an opportunity to take advantage of the latest te technological advances that would in fact be of some benefit in keeping the cost down? That, that is true, sir. I thank the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Washington. Mr. Upton? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mazanov, I have a question. I probably should have asked the GAO when they were here earlier, but isn't it true that the uh, GAO could get the price uh, data, the cost data from uh, HICFA or the CBO, Congressional Budget Office? I, <coughs> I suspect they, I don't see why they couldn't. Uh, having been in the government a long time, there's almost nothing they can't get if they... If they they uh, might not have been able to, to print it by drug, but they could used, at least use it for their statistical survey. I would think that's so, and those are a substantial amount of uh, discounts that we are paying to the Medicaid uh, program. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Nemeth, uh, Mr. Smith, you in indicated that for the, you commented for the record that you had looked at, I think it was a dozen drugs, uh, pricing drugs uh, between the U.S. And, and Canada. My, would you be able to supply that for the record? Yes, of course. Uh, and Mr. Nemeth, uh, and we did see, uh, as I believe, a, a Merck study of seven drugs. Would you be able to do the same thing for the drugs that were included in the CB in the uh, GAO study? Certainly, sir. I'm f sorry for Pfizer. I mean, yes. You could do On behalf of thing. Pfizer. Great. The. Um, <laughs> The compulsory licensing, it's, uh, it's my understanding, is now over with in Canada. Is that correct? Uh, and that's a recent change. Uh, I'd like to hear from the, each of the three of you, perhaps, in terms of what this will do with regard to pricing of drugs uh, sold in Canada. Uh, the compulsory licensing came in as a provision of the Canadian uh, patent law in the 60s. Uh, at that time, the amount of research and investment spent in Canada was about 8 percent, 7, 7.5 percent. Over a period while compulsory license was in, it dropped to 2.7, 2.4 percent. And since now, uh, the, the provision is coming out. Uh, and the, the research spent in Canada is starting to go back up and has, in fact, reached something like about 8 or 9 percent. So one of the factors it's had is, the fact it's had is, is that it drove out basically uh, most innovation and certainly a lot of the capital investment and a lot of the research investments made in Canada. What effect will that have? It will make prices uh, a little more even between the U.S. and Canada and in those cases where there are discrepancies. In our own case, someone had a chart up showing a very great difference between Canada and the United States on Xanax. But what they compared was uh, a product here which still has seven or eight months of patent life on it, but a product whose patent was artificially taken away by compulsory, compulsory licensing. So our prices in Canada have come down, came, uh, on Xanax, came down to reflect that generic status. So that, that's not a very valid comparison back and forth. It's one of the things that, that was mentioned this morning on the generics. Now with compulsory licensing, what will happen is you'll see a market dynamics that are, that are closer to what's happening in this country. You'll see the products will run, they're, they're, will come off patent, on a normal, at the normal time, and generics will come into play, and those prices will drop. Uh, by the same way, uh, in, the, in the last while, um, price increases have more or less paralleled the CPI in Canada. That's beginning to happen here, and I think if you look out three or four years, you'll see the same same dynamic happening. I would uh, 
respond uh, somewhat differently, although I certainly don't disagree, but I'd like to, to with you what you said, Lee, but I'd like to talk about another aspect of, uh, of the changes in Canada. There was a, uh, a trade-off for these uh, changes which eliminated compulsory licensing and uh, uh, restored a reasonable degree of patent term, extent, uh, patent life. But in, 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 in exchange, they put in this PMPRB, which everybody is, is, is talking about. And, uh, and I think people have, well, why is that a good thing for us to put into this country? So uh, it seems to me that, uh, first of all, nobody knows what the impact of the PMPRB is going to be in Canada. It was put in about five years ago as kind of a, uh, an oversight thing without any, uh, without any uh, uh, powers. And then, as often happens, just in a brief period of time now, it is there. And it thoroughly controls every aspect of prices in Canada for pharmaceuticals. And let's not forget that. The entry price is determined by one of two baskets they use. Uh, one of which is based on a competitive price in Canada, the other is some kind of basket of seven prices abroad. And then you can't raise your prices more than a consumer price uh, index. So it is uh, an all-embracing, all-touching price control mechanism. And the reason I say nobody knows what the impact of that is going to be is Canada is going in exactly the opposite direction from what every other country in the world is doing, except maybe the United States, which is trying to increase the impact of market forces and con consumer engagement in the selection of pharmaceutical products. The, as I said in my testimony, the European community said market forces, consumer choice, uh, co-payment, all of those things are elements of introducing the notion of responsibility. Government pays. Government pays. That philosophy is what has driven the consumption of pharmaceuticals abroad at an enormous rate. So I, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Just briefly comment. Uh, just real quickly, uh, uh, my understanding is that the uh, the government of Canada admits that uh, prices will probably go up. Those prices will be probably more fair on a worldwide basis. Uh, the numbers that we've seen from the federal government of Canada estimate that uh, that uh, costs will go up about $125 million over the next five years as a result. About $1 per Canadian citizen per year. In response, they expect about $660 million of research investment into the economy. Thank you very much. Mr. Greenwood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to address this question to uh, Mr. Mossinghoff, maybe perhaps on behalf of all of the, the, uh, the companies and then to any other of the representative companies that would like to respond. I would very much like it if uh, I could uh, do something here in Washington that would reduce the price to pharmaceuticals for my constituents who have to pay full price for them. And from what we've heard, uh, all day, what we don't want to do is reduce the amount of funds that you have left over for research. So we can't, we don't want to, we don't want to harm that part of your budget. Uh, we've heard that uh, we, we there's a need to reduce the uh, amount that's spent on promotions, but a lot of the testimony has indicated that it's not really advertising per se. It's not buying billboards and TV ads and magazine advertisements. It's 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 informing physicians and so forth. Now that leaves apparently the place where we have to squeeze is in your profitability. The question that I have is if, uh, if the Congress does something to reduce profits and you pay uh, less in dividends to your stockholders, what's the, what's the result of that? Is that uh, just is the total imp impact of such a course of action simply that stockholders don't make as, as much uh, uh, in dividends or is, is there will be some impact on that in the in the funds that you have available in terms of investment for research and, and your other functions? Well, let me answer that in two ways. One is, that, as I pointed out in my statement, Congressman, the, the uh, price increases for pharmaceuticals at 5.1 percent producer price index are the lowest they've been in 15 years. The, the industry really is moderating its price increases, and the trend as shown in the table in my statement is absolutely definitive. In Washington, sometimes people like to extrapolate from one or two data points. This is a whole set of data points coming down. Uh, secondly, I would say that the uh, PMA represents uh, both the established pharmaceutical companies represented at the table here and also the biotechnology companies. They're, most of them are either in as members of PMA or as research affiliates of PMA. And I would think the specter of government price controls, government imposed price controls, would be a serious wound to the established companies and I think it would be a death knell for the, pharm for the biotechnology companies. I don't think anyone's going to put risk capital into a company knowing the odds are probably 50 to 1 that they're not going to come up with a product that, that is, a, is a blockbuster on the pharmaceutical level. Nobody's going to put risk capital in that knowing that when they come out there's going to be a government board 
that's going to control the prices that they charge. And uh, one final question. I suppose I'm the last question, and this may be one of the last questions. And since uh, this entire hearing was uh, based on uh, the GAO study, I'd like to uh, address Dr. Burnt if, uh, this question. If one of your graduate students had uh, handed in the GAO report, what grade would you give it? <laughs> uh, a very poor grade for looking at, for interpreting the study, because the study, contrary to what Dr. Schonelmeyer indicates, did not look at the final cost to consumers. It did not ask the question about discounts paid by uh, Medicaid and things like that. And it uh, would receive a very poor grade for responding appropriately to the question that was addressed. In terms of statistical analysis, uh, I was able to replicate their results. Uh, however, it was incomplete in the, the procedures that were followed. So I guess it would, if it were a PhD student, it would be a pretty poor grade. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Schondelmeyer, I'd like to give you a chance to respond to that last comment. Yeah, again, uh, I think his critique is of a research question that we were not addressing. Uh, if I were to evaluate his critique, uh, I would say it has some interesting points, but I would point out that criticizing transaction prices versus um, AWP based on 1962 to 1966 data in a market that's had very dynamic change in the last two decades is uh, uh, beyond belief to me that he would even pull that out because we have uh, third parties in this market. We didn't at that time. We have Medicaid in this market. We didn't at that time. We didn't even have the concept of average wholesale price uh, at that time, which we do today. Also, I'd point out that uh, Mr. Mosinghoff and others have said that we use the sticker prices in the highest possible price in this study. Actually, we did not. We did not use the average wholesale price, which would have shown that the difference would have been another uh, 15 to 20 percent higher than what we reported already. So uh, we did not choose a worst case scenario. That was not our intent, uh, and that was not our practice in this process either. Well, it's interesting. Uh, yes, Mr. Burnt, to respond to your question as well. Well, we'll give him a chance to respond. Mr. Burnt. Thank you. The reason I let me take up on your point, Dr. Schondelmeyer. I agree completely that the buying power of large buyers has improved over the last four years. It is precisely for that reason that I believe your study is very biased and that referring to list price changes over time dramatically overstates price changes over time in transactions prices. In the context in which we have increasingly finding uh, negotiated large buyers versus negotiated large sellers, List prices are just the opening salvo launched by the large sellers. And undoubtedly, the final agreed upon price is much, much lower, most likely ever lower, and precisely as Dr. Schonelmeyer argues, as buyers consolidate more power. Mr. Burnt, uh, I'm going to interrupt you. And I just want to, I think most of us here have lost completely this dispute. But does anybody at this table disagree with the proposition that the consumers for prescription drugs in the United States are paying more for those drugs than consumers for those very same drugs in Canada. Do you disagree with that proposition, Mr. Byrne? No, I never said I, I state this grossly exaggerated finding, however. The gross exaggeration could depend on whether you have the financial resources to buy the drug or not. You know, I, I have a lot of constituents who might tell me you're, the gross exaggeration of the difference between what they charge in Canada and the United States does not make a lot of difference when they can't afford the drug in the United States or they have to go without heat or they have to go without rent or they split the drug in half even though the doctor says not to. Uh, does anybody at this table dispute the proposition that the drug prices in the United States are higher for American consumers than they are in Canada? I, I know it depends how you know if we want to. I'm not an economist, sir, but uh, there are a lot of ways to evaluate. Sounds like you're about to answer the question like one. <laughs> All right, well, then I'll answer. It. I am an anthropologist, though, and I'll answer it as an anthropologist. Uh, it's a question of you know you're talking about absolutes or ability to pay. And I think when you look at prices, you also, as I alluded to when I talked about Mexico, well, ability you, to pay. Wait a second. I, I can't let you say that. If I'm going to go buy a product. And the product is five dollars here, and it's one dollar there. Don't tell me the question has to do with whether I have the ability to pay or not. The question is in terms of the price differential. Is it not true that the American consumer pays a higher price for drugs than the cons Canadian consumer pays? In absolute terms, yes. In ability to pay, I'm not quite sure. I'll accept you're throwing that in. 
I don't know what it adds. Um, do you want to dispute it, Mr. Lane? Just says my testimony shown for Merck Drugs now. I'm sorry, what? For Merck Drugs, Canadian citizens and American citizens pay about the same. For Merck Products. Well, I think that's true, and I think it depends on the degree, and I think it depends on the product. You, you, you saw from my testimony that there are over half. This is not the case. Well, I was impressed by Dr. Schondelmeyer's statement that when uh, some of those earlier witnesses we had go out to buy a product that they need, or any consumer goes out to buy a drug that he or she needs, they don't want to know about the average price of the overall line of any in individual manufacturer. They want to know what that product's going to cost them and whether they can afford it. But well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, do you want to add something to more to this before we conclude? If, if I can, does, I think that last statement, and we totally agree, it, it has to do with access. It has to do with, a, with providing access to the people who can't afford a Canadian price or can't afford a U.S. price, and we want to work with you on that. We think that drugs must be covered in any managed competition health care reform. We want to work with the subcommittee to make sure it's done in a responsible way. Well, I, I appreciate that comment. It's a very constructive one. Let me just say that we want to work with you, but it has to be understood that any uh, health care system that we have in this country and expect that we'll have a major reform and I hope it will include prescription drugs cannot be based on the American consumers paying whatever the pharmaceutical companies want them to pay especially when they have a monopoly granted to them by law uh, uh, under the patent it cannot just be whatever the companies want it has to be something worked out so that it's fair and reasonable and manageable so access is uh, affordable with that, uh, if, unless anybody else has anything else to say, we've been here a long time. Let's hope to continue in a constructive way after this hearing to work on this problem. That uh, concludes our business. We stand adjourned. The U.S. House of Representatives will convene later today and will bring you live and complete coverage of those proceedings. The session is scheduled to begin at 12 noon Eastern Time today. And you may send comments about this hearing to the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee at 2415 Rayburn House Office Building in Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20515. The most powerful court in the land, the Supreme Court of the United States. Learn more about this American institution with Justice for All. Justice for All reviews the history of the Supreme Court.